Travolting presents The Fraser's Edge. Hosted by Jeff Sweeney and Stuart Elmore. Covering the passion of Darkly New. With special guest, Cole Bradley. Welcome, foolish mortals, to the Halloween episode of Travolting. And sir, oh, oh, thunder, oh. lightning strike, organ music theme here. Because that's right, folks. We're recording at high darkly noon right now. It it actually is like it actually noon, is noon at 12, the, 20, the, uh, And the clouds did just cover the sun here in uh, Chicago, Illinois. So it is a darkly noon yeah, right now. Yes, darkly noon. That's a little scary. Welcome. It's a little to scary. The Halloween episode. Can Michael do a special music for the Halloween episode? Yeah, with like theremin and the like organ? Can he have like a one week turnaround? <laughs> <laughs> I already asked him to do a Christmas bun one, so maybe maybe I can get him. Are you know. not just going to play the Monster Mash? <laughs> I think there's some copyright stuff. <laughs> Who gives a shit? <laughs> well, Stuart, we did end an entire episode with It's Christmas Say Noel last uh, year. I really wish you did bring that up. Did you listen to that episode, Cole? No, the the Travolting Christmas episode. You didn't. I listen. did not. It is bor- not it, It's borderline abusive. It's not borderline. It is abusive. It is not. Uh, there's I nothing refuse, borderline about that. I refuse to listen to the show until I receive an apology for the vile slander that has been spoken about me. <laughs> what vile show. slander? <laughs> Uh, one of your guests called me a bully. I am not a bully. I am a sweetheart. <laughs> Who called you a bully? I don't. It, Who listen. did call me a bully? It I, was it was Kathy Schumann. It was uh, Kathy Schumann, <laughs> who I've never even met. <laughs> she, she did call him a bully. Oh my god! It was probably because of the Take It Up Pelham one two three episode. No, it was the Gotti episode. <laughs> he wasn't a bully. You weren't even. You weren't a bully. The, his episode wasn't even out yet. How does she know he's a bully? Well, it's got, my point from, exactly <laughs> from real life experience. We've never met. <laughs> <laughs> Secondhand slander. Oh my god! He, but he would like to receive a formal apology, I suppose. Okay, and then I will listen to the show again. <laughs> it, it, well, we got when's Kathy coming back on the podcast? Uh, Ka- I got to figure out because Ka- Kathy doesn't know. She didn't know who Brennan Fraser was. Oh my god! <laughs> when I told her, all the more reason we have to get Kathy yes. on. Bring, hashtag bring Kathy back. Bring Kathy back. Yeah. Um, the try cr- to think of what the funniest movie. Crash. Well, we've talked about this, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't told Stuart this. Oh, you haven't told Stuart yet. Tell him off mic. It's fine. Okay. Tell me on mic. You know mic. I'm right. Tell me on mic. <laughs> Stuart's also going to know that I'm right. Tell me on mic. I don't like that I'm right. Tell me on mic. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me on my oh, okay. gem. So, <laughs> so, you know how we did a five-hour Gotti episode last year? Oh, no. Where we brought every single previous guest back to talk oh, about Gotti? Oh, no. There's o- the only movie that kind of makes sense for that for Fraser would be Crash. Oh, my God. I know. I don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> I also just don't know if I want to talk about Crash for five hours. No. So. I don't want to talk about Crash at all, but it's, it's it's you kind of have to do it. I mean, we could do The Whale. The, but maybe? that's going to be a good movie, though. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Mm. It's getting, like, good accolades mm. at best film festivals. <laughs> I forgot that it's Cole we'll Bradley's see. our go- guest. So. <laughs> good movies are bad movies. Bad movies are good movies. And this, like, we'll parallel see. dimension <laughs> of Cole Bradley. <laughs> I will say this, and I want to go on the record. It is... um. October 23rd, 2022. Uh, we're about five months out. I just want to go on the record here. Uh, everyone who thinks Brendan Fraser is winning an Oscar this year uh, probably needs to be in an assisted living home because wow. they probably cannot take care of their own faculties. Wow. It is not happening. He's going to get wow. nominated. He's always a million percent getting nominated. It is insane to think that he would win. That's ridiculous. All right. Well, lay it out. This lay is it the out. four minute mark lay it of out. episode thirteen. Lay it out. Lay. It, I I know. Just lay it out for the the listener at home. Uh, first of all, that movie sounds incredibly unpleasant. Even the boosters are saying it's incredibly unpleasant. Right. Yeah, like it's unpleasant to watch. Strike number one. Strike number two. How many people win Oscars at their first chance at bat? And I don't mean literally first-time nomination. I mean 
first time they're buzzed. Mm-hmm. Especially best actor, they want you to be proven. Point number three, Brendan Fraser is a children's movie actor. And I'm sorry, he's a very good children's movie actor, but that's a huge bias for him to overcome. And mm-hmm. the natural extension of that bias uh, is, is the nomination. Yeah. Honestly. Point number four, he's up against one of the most universally beloved movie stars of the modern era who has worked with everyone who's going to be voting for that award and who everybody likes. Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell, who's getting the best reviews of his career. Like, this is not... For what movie? The Banshees of Inisherin, uh, which I'm seeing on Sunday. I haven't seen it yet. I'm seeing it tomorrow. <sighs> hate you. That's how I know I'm right, because I haven't seen either of these movies. So I'm not biased by my knowledge of the movies. Mm. But I know Oscars. They aren't going to go with the novelty pick over the, like, guy who's actually due. And I'm sorry... They don't think there's no way they're going to actually think Brendan Fraser is due for an Oscar. It's, it's nice for him to be in the club. And if anyone gets the we didn't appreciate you back in the day juice this year, it's going to be Kahi Kwan. I apologize if I mispronounced his name. He has a better chance of winning an Oscar this year than Brendan Fraser does. What I hate the most about this is that I'm right. Yeah. I know I'm right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Austin Butler probably should win. There's no way Austin Butler's winning. It's not a value judgment. The way I, I saw Stewart go through all five stages there in which he got to accept things. He's like, Cole's making some good points here. <laughs> we just need to rip this band. Okay. Brendan Fraser's chances, like this, this nebulous idea that he is the far and away front runner exists in the internet because the people who write about movies are the people who buy super yucky shirts, right? Like yes. his core base when he was a movie star are the sort of people who are writing prognosticating columns now. Even if they don't particularly think of themselves as that base, that's the generation we're in right now. Those aren't the people who vote on the awards. Right, yeah. At the end of the day, it's it's a bubble and like i said the same thing about renee zellweger three years ago and i'll admit i was wrong but she had zero competition and fraser has to fight off austin butler and colin farrell at the same time and like bill nye sneaking in you know <laughs> i've seen you bill nye i know what you're doing <laughs> i see you bill nye <laughs> You're well, talking um, about this like it's a it's a um, cage match in um, January. We have to look forward to. <laughs> it's in March. Uh, it kind March. of is. It's, yeah. it's late again this year. I don't like it. Oh, Sir, wow. do you Jeff, I've it... given you, Jeff. I've given you my rant about uh, how they timed last year's Oscars wrong and fucked everything up, and they're doing it again this year. Have yes. I given you that rant? Yes, you have. Okay. And Stuart, do you remember your Oscars party was like the last thing we did before the yeah. world exploded? And you remember I scored the highest? <sighs> yeah. But here's the thing. I kind of cheat because mm-hmm. I wait till all the other awards are in. Mm-hmm. Because whoever wins the SAG Awards, it's got like a 95% chance of winning uh, the Oscar. I wouldn't push that that hard It's these pretty days, close, yes. though, because it's the it's, same it's voters. It's pretty close. You can probably predict a little better off Producers Guild, at least for picture. Um, then you can acting SAG acting to, to regular acting. Um, Parasite was the outlier, I will say. Mm-hmm. I Parasite was Parasite won Ensemble. Everyone forgets that. Yeah, but I, for me, it was like because was it was it the Producers Guild where Revenant w- took like a lot in Parasite in, in what in what year? The same year Parasite. No, nineteen seventeen won PGA. Oh, that's right. It was um, nineteen seventeen, and but there was another movie that was. Head to head with like Parasite for Best Picture that year. No, it was just 1917. Was it just 1917? By, by the time the cards fell, it was just 1917. And the fact that Bong Joon Ho wins three Oscars himself means that probably wasn't even close. Mm. It was just 1917. Because when um, Bong Joon Ho won director, I immediately was thinking it it, it was going to be um it was going to be 1917 for picture, but. No. It would, it would have been the other way around if it would have been it. Mm. Preferential ballot, 1917 probably had like... 1917 does not have second and third place votes. Um, Just like, you know, 
I always forget that it's ranked choice voting. Yeah, that's you got to remember it's ranked choice voting and the other awards bodies aren't ranked choice voting. And that's why we have so many director picture splits this year. Uh, and we're going to get another one this year, um, which I'm also happy to go on the record for because I know I'm right about this. Lay it out. Predict the predict the big. I ones. mean, we're, you're saying all this on a hot mic, and we have the timestamps. <laughs> I know. <laughs> October twenty third, twenty twenty two. October twenty third. I feel I I reserve the right to, you know, reverse this. But right now, I'm here to tell you, um, Banshees of Inisherin is winning Best Picture. Steven Spielberg is winning Best Director. Colin Farrell is winning Best Actor. Mm, Kate Blanchett is probably winning Best Actress. Uh, I don't feel great about that. I have no idea who's winning Best Supporting Actor, and Michelle Williams is still going to end up getting nominated and win Best Supporting, <laughs> supporting Actress. Actress. Cole, I have a, an issue. And the issue. Daniels are winning Screenplay, and Sarah Polly is winning Screenplay. Cole, I have an issue for you, though, with, yes. with that. Yes. Did we not learn anything from the 2016 Oscars So White thing? Because that those were all white people. You, no, no, Oscar So White wasn't all white people won. It was no nominees of color. And you have guaranteed nominees of color in almost every category this year. I I still feel like even with the no uh, winners being people of color might, might shuffle some That's, feathers. It's not... It's not like a body that picks the awards, though, is the thing. You can't sit here and be like, well, they wouldn't, they would design it to fit, to like avoid controversy because it's not a designed win, right? Right. Sure, sure, sure. Like there have been all white acting slates, win slates since um, that controversy happened. Right. Mm -hmm. There, there, there yeah. have. Like there have also not been. Like it's, it's complicated. The issue there was always that it was just a lily white field. And it's not a lily white field here. It's probably a whiter field than it should be because I think <sighs> women talking is probably going to like take up some space in supporting actress that should be going to Woman King. Okay. Just to throw that out there, having seen both those movies and liking both those movies quite a bit. If it, if it ends up shaking that Women Talking gets two supporting nominations and Women King gets zero. That's kind of annoying. Mm. Because but, they, give, they give it all to the white movie. Exactly. And Women and, and women Talking is a very good movie that people are going to really like when it comes out in Christmas, which is a hilarious time to release that movie. Um, but a smart time to release that movie. This is my hot take. Hot takes. Hot sure. takes. You know, Cole, I, I really appreciate how passionate you are. My other hot take is that I don't think there's going to be a non-English language movie in Best Picture this year. I I um, very much see that being a reality. I think I think Triangle of Paradise is going to take what would be that slot, and that that is a non-American movie, but it is obviously in English. English and it's also dog shit. All right, fuck Ruben Osland. <laughs> Piece of shit director, absolute mouth breeder. Wishes he was Adam McKay. <laughs> Well, I'm going to take well, all this passion. You know, and you know what else is everything everywhere all at once is barely a real movie and hates gay people. Okay, Darkly Noon, let's go. All right, you know, you know what, you know what, you know what's a hot take? You know what's a what? hot take? Brendan Fraser in this movie. He's a hot take off the platter. <laughs> can we can we start off with initial viewpoints and then get into context? Initial viewpoints. What what we liked and disliked. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Because I was like, what do you mean, like the political spectrum no, you're coming into this movie? You know what I mean? Well, like, get started with our initial takes and then we'll go into context. Okay. Yes. Jeff. That, that should work. You start. Pretty good movie. Pretty good movie. Pretty good. So, Cole. Like, Cole. No. Well, I, you, you, you know, I have to be on the best movie. Right. <laughs> so, this is the best movie. <laughs> And, and I feel like you picked this movie and then you had to contort your argument no, to no, make no, no, it no, the no, best no. movie. No, 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 no. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, would you like to tell Stuart what happened when you told me you were doing Brendan Fraser? You immediately claimed Darkly Noon and then you claimed Killers of the Flower Moon because there's a chance it might be better. But what did I say? What did you say? I said if you gave Darkly Noon to anyone else, it would be a friendship extinction level event. 
<laughs> Damn. Okay, that's accurate. Okay, like, so you, I you did was... say that. So, pretty good. Best movie ever. No, 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 no. Not uh, the best movie ever. Brendan Fraser's best movie. Uh, that, and, that seems like a loaded statement and right when there. I when I when I said that about Pelham for Travolta like I do believe Pelham is Travolta's best movie there are obviously other great movies that John Travolta had been in uh it it, it was kind of a battle of inches there this is like unequivocally Brendan Fraser's best movie like nothing else is even this is the one great movie he ever made wow. he made plenty of good movies and he's got that Scorsese coming down the pike so who knows but as it stands, and we've not seen everything. This is the one truly great. Oh, you movie. might really like Younger and Younger. <laughs> Maybe I will. <laughs> Glory Days is also famously good. Um, <laughs> Everyone knows. Though this. I don't remember he was in that. Um, I liked The Quiet American a lot back in 2002, but I don't remember a single thing about it. What about Extraordinary Measures? Never seen Extraordinary Measures. Never seen Gods and Monsters, which is probably quite good. Um. I'm just I'm scanning over the list here. Yeah, this is this is easily the only great movie he's ever made. While while so okay, so best Brendan Fraser movie, pretty good for Jeff. I'm gonna also gonna say uh pretty good. Pretty okay, yeah. so we all like this movie. Hell what? yeah, let's go. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty good. And I Oh shit, he's in G.I. Joe, isn't he? He is in G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra. That movie kind of kicks ass, <laughs> but no, this this is still it. <laughs> Close all of with GI Joe Rising Cobra. GI Joe Rising Cobra is really good. It I'm d- just gonna put that. It out has a there. very wild cast. I'm very interested to see what you guys found interesting and good about this movie. I think it might line up, but not in the same capacity. Because mm-hmm. I liked. A lot of I, there are a lot of things that I liked pretty well, yeah. But there wasn't a single segment of the movie that I was balls to the wall, batshit crazy, jerking myself off over. Did you I, did you actually stop the movie about with fifteen minutes left? Did you just turn it off when they're when they're at, at about the hour and thirty minute mark? What you mean the credits when it was over? Yes, the last fifteen minutes are balls to the wall bonkers. How'd you not love that? Well, no, I I loved I loved that. I loved it. It was a pretty great part, but that's what I mean. It's like I loved everything to like a mildly pretty good level. Yeah, but I, there wasn't a single segment of it where I was like, "Holy fucking shit!" Like this is amazing. I don't know. You must I'm, have just like gone blind. You must have been in a daze. There's like a five minutes here where there's a nude Fraser running around covered in blood. I, I Stuart, I, I do kind of agree with you. Like yeah. I do think this is a textbook like some better than parts yes movie yes but but partially by design because it is such an abrasive movie yeah in so many ways and is is so repellent in so many ways and 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 repellent in different ways at the same time in some scenes kind of normal in other scenes it lurches around but but the, the 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 broader piece i think is is incredibly captivating yeah. in a way where if you've watched any given five minutes of this movie even the ending you would probably be like this is a bad movie right but if you watch but, the whole thing the, it comes the, together the, the text works I yes think, yeah as a complete text. yeah i think cole you and i are on the same page about it yeah yeah there was you can't drop in at a random scene and be excited to watch the whole thing you have to go from start to finish yeah yeah okay I, I'm actually shocked we're all in complete alignment on this movie. <laughs> this is this will be a good discussion. It's okay. a it's a I, I do think this is a great movie. It also might be Philip Ridley's worst movie. Uh, but <laughs> Philip Ridley like quietly. You rules. mean his only movie? <laughs> no, he's made three movies. They're all great. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. If he had made more movies, I feel like he would be a guy people talk about a lot. He'd... But he made three. And one of them kind of got pilloried immediately because came out at a bad time. Uh, but it's very good. They're, they're all they're all great. They're and this one, I mean, I haven't seen Heartless in forever. Uh, as much as I like this movie and as much as I like Heartless, uh, the reflecting skin is like one of the greatest movies ever made. I haven't seen anyone. any of the other movies. And also feels like when you're done watching it, like a ghost is going to murder you. 
Like almost more than any movie I've seen, the reflecting skin feels cursed and evil. Oh, Vigo Mortensen's in reflecting skin. It's like one of his first big leading roles. And is he in Heartless too? He's not in Heartless. No. It would be fun if he was in Heartless. Well, it's just like um, you you love to see I don't know how you feel about this, Cole, but I always love to see like the actor director combos, not leading I love actor, it. not it's lead, my favorite. Re, thing. It, it doesn't even have to be leading actor director combo, like Cecilian Murphy and Christopher Nolan. I love them together, and he's not even a lead in most of his movies. Yeah, but he's I, about to be. He's about to be. He's about to be. And it's probably going to be the worst Christopher Nolan movie, unfortunately. It's probably going to be the best movie ever made. I mean, Christopher Nolan hot streak. He dumped his brother. He dumped the dead weight. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Jonathan went off and did Westworld. He did. Jeff, what's the best Christopher Nolan movie? Um, From Interstellar. Ridiculous. It's Dunkirk. (laughs) Stuart, what's the second best Christopher Nolan movie? It's... um... It's Tenet. I'll just answer. No, that. It's no, 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 no. It's uh, the Guy Pierce uh, movie he did. Memento? That's psychotic. Memento. That movie is fine. No, I think, uh, I think he Memento. made Tenet. It's Tenet. No, Tenet. The I two he off. made without his deadweight brother who sucks. <laughs> no, I think it's Memento and I almost say Inception, but I know that's probably a cop out answer for a lot of people. Inception kicks ass. We love Inception. Yeah, I think Inception's a popular choice. Interstellar's bad, Jeff. Interstellar is pretty bad. It's a great movie. It's It's bad. Don't let me leave, (laughs) Murph. Love is the incalculable sensation of what we all hold dear the most. I'm going to start start crying right now. Do you ever think about how his son hits puberty and his voice gets higher. <laughs> he goes from <laughs> Timothy Shelman to Casey Affleck. It's such a, I don't know if it's a downgrade or is wrong. <laughs> mm. Who would you rather be trapped in a room with Timothy Chalamet or Casey Affleck? C- Casey Affleck. I've heard horror stories about Timothy Chalamet. I feel, I feel like, like all I could the beat Casey up Affleck. Timothy Chalamet though. I feel like also all the, uh, the Casey Affleck horror stories are from when before he got sober. So if we're talking like right now, like you're probably like going to dodge a lot of the bad behavior. Um, on the other hand, I did apologies go to NYU, which means that if I am in a room with Timothy Chalamet, there is a statistically decent chance that I get syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, we we know someone. allegedly. <laughs> Jeff, we know someone who's worked with Timothy Chalamet. Yes, and so I feel like I've heard a lot of horror stories. I would much rather be with Casey yes. Affleck. I I believe it. Yeah, about Timmy. Oh, <laughs> Timmy. Did Shallots. you know that David Gordon Green is in the new, uh, the new Luca Guadagnino Bones and all? He's in that. He's in it. Isn't he busy directing Exorcist like seven? There's a dude who looks like him in the trailer, and I was like, that's so weird. And then I looked at the cast list, and he's in it. <laughs> he's like Michael Stuhlbarg's sidekick or something. He's so busy nowadays. <laughs> he's he also so in busy? The, the bad Nicolas Cage movie from earlier this year. Oh, the unbearable way of... Yeah. That, that thing was that was disappointing. Yeah, but Dave Gordon Green plays himself in it. <laughs> I, I, I heard saw unbearable that movie, way was disappointing and that was partly my reason for it not was, going to um, see it. It is an unbearable wait Because I was hoping it was going to be good and the moment people said it was bad, I'm like, I don't even want to watch it then and be disappointed. I yeah, really because don't. like, it's the kind of movie where like... Pig was amazing. I, I have not Pig seen Pig also sucks. Pig is amazing. Fuck off, Pig Cole. is... Pig is the one of the best Nicolas Cage movies he's ever done in his entire career. Not, That's insane. I'm he, constantly told Pig is a very much a Jeff movie, and I have not seen it. You need to watch it. No, but, you know what is a Jeff movie? The Passion it's of Black Adam. Oh my god! I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm refusing. You're to probably see. right about that. <laughs> Stewart. Stewart. Yes. Stewart. Yes. Black Adam has a skateboarding tween sidekick. Oh my god! <laughs> the last third of the movie wearing a Superman cape and fighting zombies. Jeff, where's your A-list movie stubs? <laughs> you need to get to AMC right now. <laughs> see Black Adam. And see Black. Pause the podcast. I'm gonna it's put not a beat good, here. To be clear. Oh sure, I'm sure. But it's it's like the superhero money heist. It's gonna be like is it I is it gonna be like Aquaman? Wait, Stuart. Or Cole, you said superhero money. Did Sorry, you mean money, money plane. plane? I apologize, Stuart. 
Yeah. It's called a money plane. <laughs> I know it's called money plane. We yeah. talked about you it before. See, you want to see a dude fucking an alligator? Money plane. Okay. Jeff, what if I told you there was an establishing shot of Hawkman's mansion and the title card on the bottom of the screen in the establishing shot reads Hawkman's Hawk mansion. <laughs> 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 what if I told you Henry Winkler literally facetimes into this movie oh my god <laughs> holy shit <laughs> what I if got, I, I got see black you, adam yeah and listeners skip ahead 30 seconds if you don't want to be spoiled on the thing that dc actively leaked about this movie okay jeff yeah. what if i told you it contains henry cavill's best superman performance <laughs> isn't he it for three seconds still <laughs> <laughs> all right all right so Context corner for Darkly Noon, Jeff. Wait, Darkly well, Noon. First, I just I just want to say, Stuart. Context corner for Darkly there's Noon. There's a part Jeff. in Money Plane <laughs> where fucking god, where We're thirty minutes into this it podcast, it cuts to a stock video of an airport from the sky, and there's like thirty planes at this airport, and it says Money Plane Secret Terminal Location. <laughs> the best part about Money Plane is that. Um, Edge doesn't move for basically the entirety of it. <laughs> they brought plane. a pro wrestler and he breaks into the cockpit. He's just the whole movie flying the plane. Jeff, you know that's like a meta joke, right? Is it? Yeah. Edge. Okay, Stuart, I promise we will get to, <laughs> to Darkly Noon in a second. Edge was like a top level ah! guy in the WWE. Like, yeah. Up there with like Cena at the time. Um, but he, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I don't think he broke his neck. I think he injured his neck and the doctors told him that like one bad fall could kill him. So he had to quit immediately. And because he was in such this like precarious state and he's fine now, he's wrestling again. He had some surgery. It's good. But for like eight years there, he was in such this precarious state that even if he like showed back up on Monday Night Raw, people couldn't touch him. Like he had to be completely isolated from any like f any fighting whatsoever. Yeah. So that's the joke of Money Plane <laughs> is that he spends the whole movie not moving. <laughs> it's it's a good gag. It's a good movie. All right. Okay. Context corner. Context story. corner for Darkly Noon, Jeff. Take it away. Okay. Um. Oh God. I got so distracted with all that conversation. I didn't even. Did you come prepared? I mean, it's yes, I came prepared. Okay. Uh, yeah, because it's it's written and directed by Philip Ridley. Right. He's only done one movie prior to this. He did some TV like stuff, right? He did like a a TV movie at one point. I mean, but... the, the reflecting skin, which Cole you have seen, and you say is a is masterpiece. One of the best movies ever made. <laughs> And then he did a TV. He did. It, he directed a single episode of. I don't know how to pronounce that. Lol du cyclone. It's like a French thing or something. Yes. Maybe. I mean, when it comes straight down to it, there's not like a huge amount of information about the conception of this movie online. Cole, do you have any? I don't know much. I don't know much about Philip Ridley. Um, beyond that, I think he's primarily a playwright. Okay, that would make um, sense for this movie. Dabbled in film. I don't think the 14 year gap between this movie and heartless was because he couldn't uh, get anything done. I just think he makes movies when he wants to, and he makes very unpleasant movies. So they don't do very well. Yes. I've just went to the trivia page on IMDb for Philip Ridley. Um, famously trustworthy for famously <laughs> trustworthy. Uh, most fascinating tidbit is it says hobbies, collecting stamps, old paperbacks, yeah. comics, model robots, model crocodiles, model Cadillacs, gardening, model making, old photographs. Who puts that in read, there? Well, do you ever read an IMDb trivia fact where you're like, this person wrote it themselves? Yes. Yeah. No, it's it's the um, the guy who plays Masa Meda in um, Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith. I don't know who that is, but continue. <laughs> He's the guy who says, this is a crisis. I don't know. That doesn't at help at all. Well, you know why you you would know this? I think I've talked about it on this show. I know it's um... also his favorite movie is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. 
great movie. Yeah, I'll buy that. And um, a lot of the rest of his trivia piece does speak to mostly his playwright abilities. Yeah. I will, like I will say, I, I don't know much about the conception of this movie, but I will say this movie is very much like of a piece with the reflecting skin. Like they, they, they are very much sister films. Um, is the, the, ref, the reflecting skin just to run through it because I think it's it's important to how do you frame this movie? Yeah, the yeah. reflecting skin is about a kid living in Kansas or somewhere in the Midwest right after the war. Um, which, and Viggo Mortensen plays his veteran World War II, okay. his veteran brother who's got like awful PTSD um, and is obsessed with nuclear fallout. Uh, and there's a serial killer working his way through this town. And the kids, because they're kids and they're like living in this world where everything is chaotic and violent, convince themselves that the lonely old spinster uh, in town is a vampire. And she's the one who's preying on everyone. Mm. But it's it's like the textbook, like... Yeah nightmare magical realism kids don't know how to process the world movie right yeah. like the one that, the one that people always try to make that never really clicks the reflecting skin is that it's the sort of movie where a kid finds a mummified fetus and thinks it's an angel and sets it up in a shrine and prays to it um but i feel like darkly noon kind of fits very much as like a sister film to that because it is the same thing of like He's he's an adult, but he's barely an adult. Like he's, yeah. he seems to have the mind of a child at times, um, whose perception of reality is warped by this strange mythology that's like semi-religious, but also very folkloric. Yeah, in a way that like calls back to the reflecting skin's sense of children trying to grasp the meaning out of everything they're hearing mm -hmm. but in this case it's like no religion as this thing that distorts itself into a form that is completely disconnected from anything yeah right. where it, the almost like i mean forest for the trees in a way makes sense for this movie in this space but also i think there's something very telling about how Movie is called The Passion of Darkly Noon because Brendan Fraser plays a cult member, like a, a hardline evangelical cult member named Darkly Noon. And his name is Darkly because his parents chose a random word out of the Bible. Yeah. Which to me says everything. It's a nonsense word. It's not a word that has any meaning in and of itself right. beyond the fact that it is in the Bible. That's how simultaneously devout and disconnected. Yeah. He yeah. is to faith where it's it's it, he has this fetishistic relationship to the practice of faith, but has no association with the meaning of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just blind dogma. Way. Yeah. Yes. But 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 it's not even real dogma. You know what I'm saying? Because he doesn't there's no real belief in it. It's just what you're told. And, and when when witchcraft enters the picture, he's able to fold that in to his own perception of the world. Right. Because like 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 for it to be blind dogma, I mean you're aware that dogmatic has like a literal catholic definition. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, like like that's that's not this. He is actually the opposite of dogmatic because dogmatic would imply a level of structure that his family has not imposed that they have divorced themselves from any sense of canonical, you know, consensus interpretations in, in service of what I do think is this very fetishistic relationship to faith. Because uh, to add to that point, Cole, and I think you bring up a very good point, um, because he doesn't utter the word witch or witchcraft or dark magic or anything until it's told to him by Roxy yes. and he starts filling in the gaps like... And that's when he starts, oh, yeah, because God wouldn't like that. But if you recognize, he never says anything about that before he was told that. Yeah. He never says anything about it. But I actually, I rewatched that bit like three times because I love his performance in that. I think his performance in this whole movie is incredible. Yeah, I agree. Um, He's very but good. But I love very, his very performance good. where he, he like, he leaps up yeah. at her when she says, 
the word witch. He is so ready. Like, not that he's been waiting for someone to justify it, but it's, it is such an immediate connection that he makes that this is able to fit yeah. into his, you know, sense of faith. And he literally leaps up towards her and parrots what he says back at, what she says back at him. Yeah. He's so exhilarated by this. He's exhilarated. He's excited. I mean, in a way, he has like another prophet mentor figure who is going to be telling him how the world works in contrast to his disdain for Callie's interpretation. We should maybe talk plot here. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Because I guarantee you no one listening to this has seen this movie. Because this is a deeply, like, obscure movie. Yes. You know what I did love, though? The only way I could find to watch this movie, uh, it was on Amazon Prime, to buy for $3. No, if you click more purchase options. Did it offer rental? Yeah, but for $3. Yeah, it was like, well, why would I yeah. rent it when I could buy yeah. it for the same price? Um, yeah, I... I rented it on YouTube for like $3. I bought yeah, I have. I nice. just... There is a Blu-ray, uh, which is, which is, which is, I have not gotten but it is it is available there in in material stuff arrow put it out on disc in 2018 i want to say which is when i saw it for the first time just because that's when it kind of brought back up on streaming services mm. uh, i had already seen heartless and reflecting skin by this point fun fact i looked up passion of dark Lunum blu-ray and the first option is um sunscreen for <laughs> for <laughs> for dark noon temp weather it's such a good name. It is a, it's great, such a name. great character name. I remember the first time watching this and that like reveal maybe five minutes in that this like kind of evocative nonsense title is actually very literal. Uh, and that Brendan Fraser is in fact playing a man named Darkly Noon. <laughs> you think that there's like symbolism. It's just exactly what's happening. Yeah. Well, it's kind of. It's symbolic as well, but. It, because it's a nonsense phrase. Yes. What is what is a a what is a dark noon? B if you extrapolate out that his name is taken from the phrase what is it looking through a glass darkly? Yes. W what does that mean to look through a glass darkly at noon? Like it's there, kind of, but it just is. It's nonsense. It, 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 it is a nonsense phrase that suggests like a skewed perception of normality. Which I think works for what this movie is because, I mean, like I said, you know, Reflecting Skin is very much a movie that is very grounded in this child's perspective. Um, I would argue that this movie, even the scenes, even before Fraser really shows up and even not so much in the scenes that are explicitly coded visually through the editing as being from his POV. Everything we see in this movie is, I think, from Darkly's perspective. Yes. And is, is transformed in that sense. Because we even see the ghost figures, and that's yes. something that only he would be seeing. But 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 not even that, like it's like how it's lit mm -hmm. yeah. is the, the the very strange lighting is is his way of viewing the world. This movie looks crazy. It, this movie looks amazing. I it's, will say it looks crazy. <laughs> it is like it is so bright. It's so overlit. It's so overexposed. Overlit. Yeah. It. Uh, I it, mean, it, it's like I said. It's. It. I think it's a distortion of reality. This movie um, is literally the lens of this camera is through a glass. Yeah. Lightly. I mean, a, a thought I had. I wrote this down at the end, but a thought I had near the end, um, because I feel like it's a gradual. The, the gradual visual look of this movie as it progresses is it begins in this house and everything is just swallowed in this overlit amber glow. Mm -hmm. And the further away they get from the house, that kind of tapers off. But I would say for the first half of the movie, I find the visual language very consistent. Yeah. And once Viggo Mortensen shows up, the lighting starts to fracture and each individual space starts to get its own equally intense color palette. Yeah. That grows over the course, that starts off muted and grows over the course of the movie until by the climax, every like room of the house and exists it, in a different color. 
And it's colors in conflict at the end. And it's colors in and a room. I, I, I don't know how familiar you guys are with Douglas Sirk, but it really made me think about how, like, in something like All That Heaven Allows, every space can just have its own completely unjustified color palette. Because, you know, Sirk moving around a space is a conveyance of emotion. And thus, because he's so heightened and almost ironic, the colors need to match that even if it doesn't make logical sense. Mm -hmm. This is like the nightmare equivalent of that. This is what I like about Colt Bradley episodes. I feel like I'm getting in like a, a master class <laughs> in like color theory and all that shit. Uh, I yeah, I, I just think I, 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 but like I said, it's it's very abrasive. And yeah. there's this question of like, does it work in any individual scene? No. But when you watch it as a piece, it all just it's it all very flows together. Ugly. Like it's but but yeah. it's a designed ugly movie that like cranks it up to the point where it looks like a Rob Zombie music video in a couple shots. <laughs> yeah. The, the uh, cave stuff, yeah. We should... I, I think we... How about this? How about... Let's just speed run through the plot and then just, like, pick our bits. Yeah. Because so like, I, I feel like we can, right? I feel like... there. So we can enough, get the context out of the... Like, well, so we I, can... I feel like enough the big points can be summarized in, like, two, three sentences, and we can do that for, like, the whole movie, and then that'll be pretty quick. Because, like... Yeah. The first thing that happens is Brendan Fraser, Darkly Noon, we don't know his name is Darkly Noon, wanders in a forest and he yeah. looks awful. Stumbling through the woods. Stumbling through the woods in like a suit. Yes. Um, and yes, bloodied, clearly injured, clearly yeah. like semi coherent. He passes out nearby a road, and uh, that is when Jude. Um, finds him jude is driving this pickup truck can i briefly sidebar oh boy <laughs> this is the one piece of context i have yes. yeah and i just need to say this this is nothing to do with the movie so jude is played by lauren d yes yeah a good actor a fine actor is good in this movie yes would you consider him necessarily a notable actor no 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 he's like a d-list 90s character actor yeah sorry to be me and lauren dean that's it. I'd like to read you a piece from Lauren Dean's Wikipedia page. Please do. <laughs> Lauren Dean has repeat, been repeatedly impersonated by suspected con artist Lauren Dean Breckenridge III. The Sheriff's Department in Orange County, California, has include, accused Breckenridge of impersonating Dean and defrauding drug rehabilitation centers across the United States, as well as the committing the theft of $75,000 in Marin <laughs> County. So this guy has an impersonator. Yes. He's <laughs> been committing <laughs> Which grand... as far as I can tell is just because they have the same name. Oh my god. <laughs> but this like deal list. You know, <laughs> he stage doesn't have actor. time to deal with this. <laughs> I know. I just think that's very funny. <laughs> that is very good. Yeah. Stanley Kubrick, Lauren Dean. So uh where were we at? Jude picks him up. <laughs> Jude picks him up. Two minutes into yeah. Jude in a pickup truck drives by, sees Brendan Fraser, uh, picks him up, puts him in the back of the truck. Yes. Drives him to Callie's house. Yes. And I think we, this is where we get the first title card. First day. Yeah. First day. Yes. Uh, this is going to be uh, repeated many times. It's, yeah. it's also an interesting structure because it it implies a sort of countdown. Right. But it doesn't tell you what the countdown is. Well, I didn't really take it as much as a countdown is the moment I knew there was like biblical religious overtones with this movie. The first thought came to mind. It's like, oh, it's like going to be a creation story. So something big is going to happen on the sixth or seventh day. But it goes past the seventh exactly. day. Exactly. Like it, it, it kind of leads you to think that. But that's not the case. Yeah. And it doesn't tell you how many days at the outset it is. Because it, it goes until what it, there's the 10th day it's 11th or 12th i should have written it down i should have written it, it, down it goes too. to 13 and then 14 is the final day thank you because okay. 14 they doesn't say 14th day it just says final it's day. his final day which that's the hammer punch right i also like that th there's there's no rhyme or reason to the structure of the days no not at all like it's some of not... the days have one scene in between yeah that's it it's like he but, wakes but it's up also on like, 
sorry, go ahead. Time wise, it doesn't feel like they're segmented in an equal pattern. Right. Yeah. Nor does it feel like the pace is adjusted. Right. Either fast to slow or slow to fast. Yeah. That each day is as long as it needs to be in and of itself. Yeah. And that combined with the like suddenness of those title cards. Yeah. Often coming like like mid beat. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Um it, it, in one it, case it, literally mid beat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it it that I think combined with the sense that you don't know how long it's going to be total, like because the first day is like 15 minutes of the runtime. Yeah. And then the the time span between day six and seven is one scene where him and Vigo Mortensen are carving wood. Yeah. And then boom, seventh day. You're like, oh, okay. What else did but they do not, on that day? It's not like it's progressively getting quicker either because right. then the, the eighth day is is slower. Like, again, it's I, to keep hammering this point of some better than this parts, like – it, it intentionally kind of wrecks the pace of the movie. Yeah. In a way that is, in a way, somewhat tiring to watch. This... And makes this movie feel far longer than its 100 minutes. Yeah. But, like, is also exhilarating because it, you never know... You really don't know what it's building to. It puts you into, like, sleepy vibes. Well, yes. I would say... It's a very sleepy movie. Well, I, I was almost going to say the opposite just because... <laughs> I watched this and Glory Days back to back from each other. Glory Days is an episode that's going to come out next week. Yeah, about it's a good the, movie. Uh, oh, okay, it's the same runtime as this. They're both an hour and forty minutes, but I I feel like this felt longer but more stomachable, engaging, engaging. Whereas Glory Days felt faster, but I fell asleep more. Well, because you're so comforted by, like, the pleasures of glory days, you know? <laughs> like, it's like a warm bath of a movie. <laughs> Could not be. I, I, the, 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 no. <laughs> the stingy whiskey taste covered in cigarette smell was not comforting a glory Jeff, days at isn't all. Isn't glory days a good movie? It's pretty good. It's, like a Jeff, solid eight out of ten. Don't do this. Eight, I don't know if it's an eight, but we I said, like We it. both agreed on five. No, I Which said six. I, hold on. I'm five. checking my letterbox. But you know I have it mean? at a seven. I have it at a seven. Okay. Like, I, I said, like, yeah, th they're the same runtime, but uh, this felt longer but more engaging. Yes. I didn't care that it felt longer, whereas Glory Days felt faster, but I wanted it to be over quick faster than it was feeling. Yeah. Here's the, here's the last thing I'll say about Glory Days. Okay. It's definitely better than Reality Bites. I have not seen that. That's a bold... Bold statement. Reality Bites, kind of not a good movie. Okay. Because Ben Affleck is a better actor than Ethan Hawke. Okay, that's oh, actually a very hot take. Oh, It's a good thing Becca's hot. not on this episode. Yeah. yeah. Fight me, Mark Tilly. Fight me, Becca. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jeff, me, we got to tell, tell your Becca story at okay. the end of this episode. Okay, so, so Cal. Yeah. Well, I, I, he I, takes Brendan Fraser wait, wait, over to... Wait. Oh, my God. I do want to say something I like about the uh, like the, the the structure of the days is that story you were saying like you thought it was a creation story and I like that it keep this movie has a lot of elements in the first half that start making you think it's going to be like one biblical story or another like you're like oh this is a creation story with the days or you're like oh there's the jealous husband who's going to come back later this is going to be like mm -hmm. a Cain and Abel type thing and or Book of Job or whatever it is. You keep like seeing these things come in and then none of them really pan out to be what you think it's going to be. And it's all just about like the meaning. I don't want to say the meaninglessness, but just kind of the, how he has no grasp on actual faith and what like it actually comes down to in the storytelling of it. He and just, he's, yeah, he's trying to narrativize yeah. a reality, which is that, it's just these yeah. two people living in the woods who are kind of having a rough go of it. Yeah, and wood and reality doesn't conform to the story. Hence, hence the ending of this movie. Yes, like the very ending of this movie. Yeah, it's like no, there's a logical explanation to all these things, but it's a nonsense logical explanation. Yes, it's just the chaos and of reality. It's the chaos of reality. I think. I think having it be. We'll get. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to the circus. Put a pin in it. Put a pin in the circus. We'll get back to the circus. <laughs> All right. So they, the Jew takes, um, who we later find out his name is Darkly, 
uh, Fraser over Darkly to, noon. to Callie's house. Uh, where Ashley we get... Judd, early Ashley Judd performance. Early I Ashley say. Judd. It's early Ashley Judd. Yeah. Hold on, I'm looking. What year is this? Is ninety five. This is ninety five. Yeah. So she does a, a time to kill the next year. She's gonna be in Heat a few months later. She's great in Heat. Yeah. Her sister and mom are very famous. She is about to break. She's great in Heat. You know what else she's good in? This movie. <laughs> she's she's pretty really good. Do, do we want to go to the plot or do we want to talk Judd for a second? Let's let's, let's talk Judd for a second. Let's talk Judd. Okay. Can I can I first put a brief pin? She is great in Heat, and she is also the recipient of the single best line in Heat. Say it. Uh, which is for me, the sun rises and sets with. Oh yes, man. yes, yes. That's the best line. Yeah, that in is heat. that is the single best moment in Heat. I know she's not in that scene, uh, but, but that's about her, her, and you believe it. You believe Cole. that relationship in her like two minutes of screen time. Did you read Heat Two? I'm like halfway through Heat Two. Okay. Good. We'll point. talk Heat Two eventually. <laughs> <laughs> the thought, the thought I've had both times watching this movie. Yes. Is that Ashley Judd, an actress who Heat aside and Bug aside, she's obviously incredible and freaking Bug. Um. Both times I've watched this movie, I've been like, oh, is Ashley Judd really bad in this movie? For like 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because I think she's intentionally giving a bad performance for the first act of the movie. Yeah, yeah until she, until I you agree. finally actually learn her real character instead of exactly. seeing her through Darkly's eyes. And, and this is my thing, is that for the first third of this movie, almost even closer to half, I feel like the gunshots are like at 35 minutes in. Yeah. Um. She is just playing this, like, motherly southern sex kitten in a way that is very, like, falls flat on its face and feels overly melodramatic. And, like, there's so much honey in everything she says. And it, it doesn't feel like a real person on because for the first 35 minutes of this movie, I guess this plot stuff is it's her nursing darkly, darkly back to health. And you're seeing um, this all through darkly's eyes. So he's and seeing, like I said, yeah. we're seeing this all through darkly's eyes. So just, just to clarify, as we've alluded to darkly is a member of a cult run by his parents. And he is apparently the sole survivor of a Ruby Ridge Waco style, like shootout with the police. Yeah. Yeah. That killed everyone else, which he paints as being this like very almost like monstrous lynching thing. Yeah. But it's also very clear that like this man um, and why I said I think this movie is in conversation with reflecting skin and the child performance, the court of reflecting skin. He, he is just a child yeah. in an adult's body. He he has no understanding of the world. He barely seems to know how to move. Like physically, and not just that he's injured, he's just it's like the opposite of like idealized innocence. It's like grotesque innocence. Well, I want to put a the, pin on the Waco comparison because there was a I eventually kind of came to this sort of hypothesis, like I want to say two thirds of the movie. Yeah. I won't say it now, but just don't let me forget about this. Uh, Waco comparison I, I, I'm, I'm glad I, I kind of have a, a vague sense of that too. Well, the, um, the connection but for the first I made. 35, Oh, the connection I made right at this point is that he's basically playing like Frankenstein. It's monster. Oh, that's good. Yes, he's, he's playing, playing like Frankenstein's monster. Because yeah. he, he even says the town people surrounded us. Yeah, and it's not like it's not like torches. He, and oh. Yeah, he, forks. he's playing. Yeah. And, he, and even when he's walking through the woods, he's kind of shuffling like Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, that's, I need to rewatch this. But I think it's a good. <laughs> Cole's like, I gotta watch the movie again. <laughs> I know, I know. I think that's that's an incredibly good way to put it. But for the first thirty odd minutes. It's just him and Callie in this house that exists in the middle of the woods in a way that feels incredibly artificial. Yeah. Like, there's a vague sense of a city somewhere um, that Callie has been cast out of, like Darkly Noon has been cast yeah. out of. But it's it's almost this cartoon space that they're living in. And because they're there just together for the whole time, I think Judd is giving this very distorted, strange performance because, like we said, 
it's it's how Darkly is viewing her, both as this like dangerous temptress and this angelic mother figure. And yeah. when we talk about that overlit amber lighting, I mean, this is kind of a simple analogy, but I think it's an intentional simple analogy because of what we said about how he views the world. The house is heaven. Yeah. And that's why it's so overlit. Yeah. And yeah. she's like this, you know, eroticized saint who is there to, to give him things. And I think I love there's this visual trick the movie repeats a lot for this first third Um where it'll it'll be doing two like two shots, you know, yeah. like shot reverse. I always say that's a two shot. That's not a two shot. A shot reverse. Um, but it'll be a tight. It'll be a fairly tight close up on Fraser. But Judd will be shot from the other side of the room, vis a vis the camera representing in her shots the actual physical distance between Callie and Darkly in this space. And it becomes just like again, it's kind of an obvious trick, but it's this like almost hyper Mulvian collapsing of the gates where you're so physically oriented in the sense that we look at her in the exact same dimensions that darkly does, but we don't look at him in the same dimensions that she does mm -hmm. because it, 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 it is, it is taking those basic principles of identification and like intentionally cranking them, I think to 11, but doing it after it's already, you know, introduced this, you know, lighting language to associate it in his POV. He's Ridley is almost challenging the audience to kind of get on his level. He's not inviting you into the visual language of the movie in a way a movie quote unquote should. Um, like a movie is designed to teach you how to view it. Yes. This and this movie, movie does not, not teach you how that. to view it. This, this movie is, immediately throwing you in and saying what like this is how we are observing the world this is how we're observing these characters adapt or die adapt or die that's good but yeah. but that's also but i think that's also like that's that's the position darkly has found himself in in a way yeah you know he is he is finally being thrust into an approximation of reality but rather than like he's not fully in civilization. I think this movie's tension to this nebulous, never seen city is very purposeful. Yes. And, he and he's in this kind of almost cosmic way station in between the world of the cult and the world of reality. And he's presented with this choice, like you said, of adapting or dying. And he instead chooses to retreat into comfort and adapt the world to his view. Yeah, and the movie kind of locks you in with him in a way. That I keep saying the word abrasive, but I'm sorry. This is a very abrasive movie. Yeah, because, like, Stuart, you were even saying this. Like, the way, like, in the cult, he all he ever knows is the cult. And then once he's put into this new reality, he starts turning that into the cult. Yeah. And that's, like, inherently where, you know... All the all everything we're saying is all coming from this basic idea that he's trying to make the unfamiliar familiar. Yeah. And Cole, you were saying like uh, Philip Ridley's previous movie, The Reflecting Skin, like it's about a kid who makes something into a vampire to try and explain it in their narrative. If we take the idea that this movie is in the same dialogue, instead of a vampire, we're using Frankenstein's monster and witches mm -hmm. and religion as like the end point to that. But these are all movies about the way we perceive monsters in reality. Mm -hmm. It's all good stuff. <laughs> yeah. his, th his, his third movie, which is basically... Um, is it about the Wolfman? No, it's oh, Faust. God. Oh. But his third movie is Faust. Uh, Heartless is Jim Sturgis from American Masterpiece Across the Universe. Um, <laughs> as this like guy who has a massive... like all over his face birthmark who kind of sells his soul to get it to be like beautiful. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a similar thing of like notions of monstrosity. And I think you're, you're onto something there. And this is the least overtly monstrous yeah. of the three, I think to a degree, but it's almost about this forced creation of monstrosity and who is that energy going to land on. And I guess to some degree, um, Oh God! What's Vigo's name? 
Clay. Uh, Clay. Clay. Clay is kind of a potentially monstrous figure, and I don't mean to be insensitive when I'm saying that. I am more referring to traditional notions of disability as being depicted as monstrous. Yeah. Um, and that when he is introduced, I think there is this brief tension of being framed in that fashion that he kind of resists. Yeah, that he well, can't. It aids I need to step to... away from the mic for one second, guys. I'm so sorry. Oh, good. Yes, yes. I was going to say, like, to Cole's point, like, it aids in Fraser's receptibility to believe Clay's been cursed or charmed. Yes. If that makes sense. Because, like, what, you know, it, any other normal person would just be like, oh, yeah, he's just mute. But it would be a person like uh, Darkly who would see someone like Clay and maybe not immediately think something's, like, supernaturally going on. But if he's fed any inkling of, oh, yeah, he's mute because of this supernatural thing, he'll grab it and snatch yeah. it right away. He's looking for a reason yeah. to see Clay as a monster. And and, and with the, Clay is also... So, like I said, the, the first 30 minutes are this, like, very angelic cornball, you know, two-hander. And then that gets disrupted twice. First by the gunshot. The first, the first disruption is very violent. Um, you know, Callie says, you know, may God strike me down the way people say it. And someone shoots into the house. And all of a sudden, this movie that's been very locked down goes into this very, like, careening handheld. And the lighting kind of bounces out to normal as she like marches outside and starts shooting back. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it's this, it's this very literal intrusion of reality that breaks the spell around her uh, and kind of reveals the real person. And then, like I said, about half of the movie, when clay does show up, that's when we get this sense of like fragmented spaces beginning to appear and the world beyond the house yeah, inviting itself to Darkly because that's the real disruption. It's not the gunfire. It's not even the sense that Callie is persecuted because that can be martyrized. It's that, no, she's happy. Yeah. And she's happy with another person, with, with a man who can actually like sexually satisfy her. I want to sort of tally through the plot a little bit because I feel yes. like we've... No, no, no. I feel like we... We cat we recapped like a lot of the earlier plot stuff, but it kind of leads into a very little happens in the first half. It is mostly yeah. just them having these very like I think intentionally shallow conversations. conversations about the nature of faith and the like. The idea of sex is something to be either feared or embraced. Yeah, and so like like right away we get we see Callie who's taking care of nursing darkly who when he wakes up he immediately is mesmerized and not mesmerized mesmerized it's the wrong word but just like has no idea how to interpret this angelic being and like in yeah. front of him whether for good or bad and so but we get some exposition where he's from a cult uh a, like the way the imdb s synopsis describe it is a ultra conservative religious christian cult uh, no, that make, that's about what the movie which is. is about what the movie is and um, and they talk about the basically the Waco siege which is what happened yeah and it I mean, this is two years after Waco exactly it's, it's very clearly what Ridley is riffing which on is what the comparison I wanted to make which was you know I looked at some of the character names from like the Waco like miniseries and like obviously thinking about folks involved in that cult and how it went down like David Koresh being like the main guy who's like sleeping with all the wives and sort of the doctrine that the seventh day uh Ad advent Adventist? Adventists yeah um wait and did they go on seventh day is that Waco n no w Wake it's, Waco it, is the name David Koresh is an, an offshoot of a religious movement called Seventh Day Adventism. Yeah, okay. it's an offshoot of that. That's that's what it's referring to. No, Waco's like yeah. a fifty day siege. Yeah, but oh, no, I just um, meant like it, if if this movie's playing off of that idea, if there's like you know first day, second day ideas. I, I don't think so. Okay, yeah, you don't, I think, don't that's think so there? either. Okay, but then I it made me think of the Steve Schneider character, 
who is basically like David Koresh's right hand man, who's sort of a victim to this mindset of he's the only man who can sleep with all the wives and all the men. All the do all the men castrate themselves in that in that coal, or is that just they just don't sleep with anybody? I, I I'm not super. I think read up on I the think it's of Indians, um, I'm sorry. Heaven's Gate is the one where they castrate themselves. Uh, the Seventh Day Adventist Waco they don't castrate themselves, but they they do vow. All the men v- make a vow of celibacy, and all their wives sleep with David yeah. Koresh. And it bre- I do just just not not to like defame anybody. I just do want to clarify. Uh, that Koresh and the Branch Davidians are an offshoot of the Seventh Day Adventists. Yeah, right. That they are not. They're not Seventh Day Adventists. Mainstream Seventh Day Adventists. Right. They, that's that's where their religious beliefs kind of originate, but they are very clearly like yeah, a, a, a an extreme. Different, but the comparison I wanted piece. to make was so David Koresh is sort of like the way it was sort of. Um, told to his followers was like he would take on the burden of sex that mm-hmm. he is because he's a prophet from god he can engage in a sinful activity without being corrupted and that was how he sort of convinced all the men to like give up their wives and daughters to koresh and it made me think brendan fraser darkly noon is basically a reality where if one of the men who followed koresh escaped from the siege yeah yeah. And what would happen? Right. Because they would well, yeah. be confronted with sexuality in the normal world. Exactly. It's very different than that. Exactly. So that that just kind of made me think of like, oh, this is basically like, what if Steve Schneider got out yeah. and wandered into the woods? It's, it's kind of yeah. how I sort of thought of it. Yeah. No, I, I think you're totally on base. I also, I also think he's kind of playing with this like, I think kind of faded for memory now, but I think very much in the mid nineties, like cultural sense that Waco was a tragedy because of overreach on the government's behalf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is still a thing people say, and we can talk about it, blah, 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 blah. Did the FBI intentionally start that fire? Probably. But, but I know that very much like it probably in the window between the Waco siege and the Oklahoma City bombing, which was very explicitly a response to the Waco siege. Yeah. Uh, there was somewhat of this cultural thing of like even not so much that people were defending Koresh as they were, well, the loss of life and the bloodshed was the government's fault. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that same thing with Ruby Ridge, which had been the year before, where it's that the 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 government is too willing to open fire first. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, which is not necessarily, I think, a cultural thing that has lingered. Uh, yeah. I feel now like- I feel like if you talk to someone about Waco now, they probably wouldn't even think that would be a real thing. I think a lot of that is Oklahoma City. That that overpowers those- it. Yeah, but culturally. but also that idea that like. Well, if you're def- th- then people think you're defending Koresh, you're defending Timothy McVeigh. Blah, blah, blah. But I think this movie's made right in that tight window where you can kind of interrogate that because Darkly paints such a, like, candy-colored portrait of it in the opening, but is also so clearly unhinged. Yeah. Yes. And, like, on the precipice of violence the whole time that it's hard to say how honest the sense of, like, we were being persecuted. They came for us. They set a fire. They murdered us. Story is told. Yeah, they sent helicopters uh, to play music. Yeah. Especially in comparison to Callie, who is also the sort of outcast. And we learn later that she's an outcast because she has been blamed by most people for having seduced and killed Clay's father. When what actually happened was he had a heart attack while trying to rape her. Yes. Which is that is such a black and white, understandable and very real world sense of like, no, this is how someone is going to get actually unjustly like persecuted. Yeah. That the kind of nebulous fairy tale that Darkly portrays, I feel like is something you're supposed to kind of be sympathetic to and then kind of grow uncomfortable with 
over yeah, the course of the, the film. The more you learn about him, the more you learn about the cult, the more you're like, okay, this was a problem. But it's not like we even learn that much of the yeah. cult. It's more but just that... You learn all you need to know about the cult from learning more about Darkly. He it, he is so uncomfortable to be around, and the visions he has are so grotesque. Yes. That you, it's not like you need to be told, like, oh, his dad was... I mean, this hypothetically, but like, oh, his dad was like sexually abusing all the women in the cult. That that doesn't matter. Yeah. What matters is that there's something rotten at the core of this that he can't process because he doesn't know anything else. Right. And he can't. Yeah. And he's in when he's removed from that that uh, that institution where, you know, he has very clear leadership from his parents. Like, yes, on that he spends the whole movie looking for that until he finally just has to imagine it from his parents again yeah because because he loses it he thinks he has it in Callie but then Callie's boyfriend Clay who is this very strange figure and I did want to say this is the thing about this movie we're talking about this movie as being like oh everything distorted is from Darkly's POV I don't think that's a hundred percent true I think some stuff in this movie is just kind of strange yes but that's because reality is kind of strange. Yeah, like the shoe in the river. That's just, that's weird. Like the shoe in the river, but that, like, Viggo Mortensen, Clay, Callie's boyfriend, is this mute carpenter who is given to disappearing into the woods for days on end. <laughs> yeah. And nobody, that doesn't strike anyone as strange. That He just goes on this hermetic things, which is just, it is devoid of meaning, and you can see these like hints of possible meaning to be applied to Clay as a character. Like we were talking about monstrosity earlier, but also he is a carpenter. Yes. Need I say more? That's he all is you a carpenter know. who goes on pilgrimages. But that's that's never a connection the movie really makes because the movie wants to use all these like iconographies of religion, yeah. and then just be like, but, but, "Well, there's just things that happen in reality." But 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 I'm saying for for Clay to be an overtly Jesus figure, which is clearly dangled in front of us, to narrativize to that degree, it, w- it is something that Darkly would do. Yes. But because Clay is a threat in a way, Darkly is not going to make him into Christ. He's going to make and him into thus, the devil. He is just an eccentric. Mm-hmm. Which which to me is like that is I think the tension in the movie of. The ex the re- the real eccentricities of life, versus the sort of like constructed surrealism of Darkly or the circus versus the cult. Yes, which is so, a great final like allegory to make. Clay comes back. We gotta get through the plot. <laughs> Cole saying we gotta get through the plot. Oh god! I know. I'm sorry, but I think it's important, and I want to get to the ending. Well, so I basically got it all the way up till the end of day two, where at the, <laughs> all right, at we the got end, twelve more days. At the end of Let's day go, two is when you know we get the explanation of the fictional Waco siege that killed uh, Darkly's family. Yes. Um, it's day three when we introduce more obvious hints of sexuality between Callie and Darkly. Yeah. The first thing he wakes up to, he looks outside and it's Callie working on the house and he's looking up her skirt. Yeah. It's the first thing that happens on day three. And he's like, I, I, I can do that. I, I, can, do I that. can do that. Mm-hmm. And then, um, <laughs> then we get the gunshots uh, and Callie shooting back. And what was, I found interesting was how she knows right away. It's like, Oh, she, like they're not aiming for me. Like I'm yeah. fine. I'm just making sure they know that I'm still here and I'm going to shoot back if they keep doing this. It's like, oh, like, shouldn't we, like, go for cover? It's like, oh, no, they're not trying to hit me, which is interesting that yeah. she has that. She knows that already. Uh, and then it's the fourth day. It was the fourth day when, and I think we should talk about this, that he's staying still. Yeah. But he's at full health, really. He's done his long rest. He's back at max HP and he's got rations. Why doesn't he just, like. Because there's nowhere to go. Right. And she, no, because he's in heaven. And yeah. he, he, he thinks he's in heaven. He thinks Why that, would he leave? And I think she he ba- she ba- she basically offers for him to stay long term, right? Yeah. Because he tells her he has no he has nobody else. And so she kind of sees him as like a, a redemption project for her. Yeah. Clear very, very clearly I think she 
views this relationship as kind of like I I can help this guy and she's willing yeah. to do what it takes. The yes. fourth day is like max um is maximum of darkly having like being at the height of like his sexual like contradictories with Callie because yeah. that's the scene where it's very hot outside they go swimming this is where like we, we, I liked I loved what you said earlier um Cole about how Ashley Judd is kind of doing like a distorted performance because it's like the fourth day she's literally like inviting him to go swimming she's taking off all her clothes and I'm literally sitting here like it is 1995 it's plausible that we're being this sexist but it's also like this is a little bit too I mean, I mean, it is, it is, it is very sexist, but it's in, it's intentionally so. Right. It's, it's leaning into the kind of sleaziness and 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 you know presented eroticism of the erotic thriller in in a in a way that is very much by design. I think I know it's by design because it goes away. Yes. Right. Very quickly once he's done with that. Because that happens, and then there's a scene where there's, like, a bug in her hair, and then she's like, can you, like, get it out for me? I love this scene because it's, like, it's two straight minutes so, of him just, like, fondling so her hair. When this happens, she's like, is there a bug in my hair? I thought she was, like, just trying to, like, get him to touch her. And then he actually produces, like, a massive bug. <laughs> right. Like, it's dead serious that there was a bug there. Yeah. But it takes he's a like, long I, I think I killed time. Him. And there's often there when it does like a shot reverse where he you see the his hand touching the back of her head. There are times where he's just spiraling her hair around his finger. He's not really looking for the bug at all, but she doesn't say anything about it. But she I mean, knows that's it what he's doing. Does it take two minutes? Like, is is screen time real time? It's a long time. You know, it feels no, that, like that's a long what I'm time. saying. Feels is like, like a long time. Like, are we meant to literally think that he's running his hands through her hair? For two straight minutes, or is it just his perspective? Or does he feel like he is? Good point. That yeah, that that that's how I feel about that scene because that scene's so weird because she basically opens it by saying there's nothing sexual about this. Yeah, but it's clearly the most erotically charged moment in the movie, and yeah. like again, tension between what is perceived and what we can conceive of as maybe existing beyond that perception, beyond the lens, in yeah. a way. And that then she shows him the cave with like the cave drawings. This was where I was like, okay, this looks like a, a built set <laughs> a little bit. It looks very but, much so. But like, I don't know really? if it goes for or against the movie because hearing all of this about like distortion of reality and how darkly sees the world that he's in, it almost kind of makes sense. Cause like literally there should be no light sources in this cave, but yet the water is glistening on the walls yeah. and it's got cave drawings on it. Yeah. But they the, look the cave is also the space that like transforms visually over the course of the movie. And it transforms darkly. Yes. And it, 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 if, if the house is heaven, I think the cave gradually becomes hell. Very gradually, yes. It, 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 what you say is this, like, sparkly... But, like, I, 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 I feel like you're reaching for this, maybe, and I'm sorry if I'm putting words in your mouth, but that, that first cave scene feels very unsure of itself, in a way. Like, nothing seems to be quite adding up. The lighting feels a little weird. Like, it feels like it needs to either be, like, as cranked up as the house is... Or more natural, and it's very liminal about it. Well, if and, that makes and sense. the dialogue's also unsure because that's when yeah. she says, "I care about you very, very much," and it's like, "Where did this come from?" This cave, much like the cave on Dagobah, is a cave of temptation. And you know what's in that cave, Stuart? What's in the cave? Only what you take with you. Right. But uh, yeah, she <laughs> is, is Dagobah. Is Dagobah where the parks are? No, Dagobah's she, where the um where Luke fights a mystical Darth Vader. It's, it where, turns Yo, it's out where Yoda's to be, hanging out uh, for like twenty Luke years under the helmet. Man, the uh, we've been we've been really good about talking about Darkly Noon for like an hour. The porks so are on really Achto. Man, fuck Yoda. <laughs> what? Wow. Yoda fucking sucks. Piece of shit. All right, lets con the kids die. Continue. You're actually not wrong. Con continuing on. <laughs> you know who fucking uh, goes, Jeff? Who? You know who kicks ass? Who? Fucking Yaddle. Fuck yeah. The one below. <laughs> the one below. 
so yeah she confesses to um darkly that she cares about him very very much which caught me off guard a little bit yeah it felt much more of like a like it kind of stays in this murky tone of like motherly love but with an added bit of sensuality to it that could also be part of darkly's distortion of it remind Um, me does he whack off before this is that night when he goes back to the barn he jerks off to Callie. Which is also kind of a moment where things start to fall apart. Because the next day, Clay comes home. Clay comes back and this like... Clay is her husband the, the, for the audience the, who's mute, played by Vico Mortison. Or boyfriend, yes. I, I do think that's an important point because this notion of them living in sin is like the final dagger in right. this perceived betrayal. Yes. On her behalf, which to clarify uh, is a perceived betrayal. Uh, I don't think the movie is saying she owes him any, you know, sexual, romantic or maternal gratification. Right. Uh, But rather he does. He thinks that that's the case. Um, But yeah, this tension is doubly broken in that he is like, given into erotic desire and then has the fantasy stripped away from him. But he also almost surrendered the fantasy in that yeah. moment. Yeah. And then, so he keeps a box of things and I, I'm trying to understand the purpose of it. It's just a picture of his parents and a Bible. And a dead bird. Oh, and a dead, no, it's not a dead bird. It's well, it's a, not a dead bird. It's a bird with barbed wire yes. around it. Because it's supposed it's, to train dogs not to like chomp down on birds. It's supposed to give trained dogs to like have soft mouths. Yes. Per what Roxy says later in the film. It's 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 if if we if we associate the sense of the Bible and the photo are what he has of his parents and his his past life. Yeah. Then that he puts. Um. Sorry, he 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 puts the bird in um in the box there because this sense of like restraint. Maybe it, it's an indication that this sense of like sadism and masochism, yeah, as an important tool to learn, right, is also of a piece with his past life. It's probably the most explicit indication we have narratively, right. That what the, he ends the up portrait doing later. he told is not that accurate. Yeah, and so because even even before he knows the meaning of that, he he understands that it's important. Yeah, um, um, but that's the fifth day, and then the yeah. sixth day we get. This is where it we it's a very quick. Sixth day is very fast. Yes, because all we get is uh, clay and darkly in the barn carving wood. Uh, it's no, I feel like it's no accident that clay is using like the carving sword. Is that what it's called? Cause it's literally a sword basically. Yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. Cause it's what darkly uses at the end of the movie. Right. It's a wood carving sword. And, but then, and then darkly is painting a crib. Yes. Red. Red. So it, it that, that's an interesting, and then. It cuts to that night. Well, because Darkly's asking Clay questions, but Clay obviously can't really respond. Um, he responds in his own way that can sort of be understood, yeah. which I think is a testament to Mortison's acting. I thought he did a really great job. Oh, Vigo's good in this. Vigo's very good in this. V- Vigo Mortensen is a good actor. Yes. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> gonna, gonna lob that, that heater <laughs> across the plate. Yeah. V- Vigo, he, very good. He just does a great job of like... Saying a lot guys, with whistles and grunts. Do, do you guys know the story of how he broke through in Hollywood? No. This is this is my favorite story. This is probably like semi apocryphal, but whatever. I love it, and I'm gonna keep, you know, printing the legend. I know Witness is one of his first movies. No, that's Witness is his first movie. Okay, yes. He has zero lines in Witness. Uh, he was hired as an extra. Yeah. But the story goes that Peter Weir was so struck by how beautiful he is because Viggo Mortensen is an incredibly beautiful man yes. Yes. that he just like, even though he didn't have any lines, he like made him one of the most important like 
figures. members of the narrative community and like kept putting him in shots and giving him like important stuff to do. Yeah, like basically any scene and, where Harrison's there, like he's next to him. Yeah, exactly. So like he he doesn't really play a character in Witness, but he's constantly there because he's so good to look at. And then people saw Witness and was like, who's this incredibly tall blue eyed god? <laughs> And then that's when, like, Rennie Harlan casts him in prison and shit. And then Ridley casts him in fucking skin. And he does Texas Chainsaw 3. And he kind of, like, then he does the, like, paying the dues, weird cult and horror movie stuff. <laughs> and um, then eventually he's Aragorn. And then uh, he, you know, eventually achieves his um, career-defining performance in 2018 <gasps> oh, as Tony oh, Lip. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, have you told Stuart the thing I told you? Uh, No. We can't say it on mic, but we'll tell Stuart after. Oh, uh, oh, yes. No, Stuart, we actually can't say this on mic. Yeah, we can't okay. say this on mic. Right. I do actually have to tell you after. Uh, I, 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 have, I have been told something very major. Do I have to cut this out of the podcast? No. 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 Okay. I have been told something very major by someone who should not have told me it. I just, I just feel Let like me just the say that, is and now it's not actually this. major. It's major for you two. Um, oh no! So, Stuart, uh, it's good. It's uh, it's not public information yet, which is why I we can't say it on mic. All right, understood. Yeah, you're but, gonna be so mad. <laughs> you will be sure. <laughs> but Vigo does. He plays Tony Lip in 2018. And we all were like, "Why hasn't he just been doing this for the past 25 years?" Actually, Stuart, can you maybe actually cut that whole aside? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I feel like we. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm good. I put good. some clap. I put some snips in there. Cut that whole side. All right. All right. Um. Put like some Jeopardy music in there. Or something. All right. Sure. Um. So then but he plays Tony Lip and was nominated for an Oscar. Yes. Which and pisses like, me off because it broke one of my favorite Oscar trivia facts. What? That's his third Oscar nomination. Can you tell me what? Uh, is the connective tissue? <laughs> Uh, between his first two Oscar nominations, no, I actually cannot. It's Eastern e- Promises, Eastern and Promises, Captain Fantastic, okay, yeah. and Captain Fantastic. And I think you guys tell me what those two movies have in common. Is it Catherine? No, no. No, you see his cock in both of them. Oh, okay. He has a full frontal nude scene in both those movies. What if in um, Green Book? It took me a second. It would have been a much better. And he's like, movie. hey, look at the size of this thing, huh? <laughs> Yes. He's like, you want to see an Italian sausage? I'll show you an Italian sausage. <laughs> All right. So then, what I, if he what if he spoke at the end of this movie and he just just Tony Lip? Uh, <laughs> He's just right. like back All to right, darkly here we are. We're noon. In the woods. What's going on? Eh? Back to it's darkly so noon. It's so funny that he's such a choosy actor. But part of being a choosy actor is that he does stuff like Green Book or the Ron Howard Thai Cave Diver movie. <laughs> Which I keep forgetting. But that, like, fits with his choosiness in a weird way. Yeah, and, like, the only... He's really good in the very good Ron Howard Cave rescue movie, by the way. I remember you texted me this, and I didn't had no idea that movie existed. That's, like, probably Ron Howard's best Which one is this? 13 Lives. It got dumped by Amazon earlier this year. Vigo's doing some of the best work of his career. Is that like the so- the Chilean like soccer kids in the cave? No, it's the Thai soccer team that got stuck in the cave. Oh right, there is big a separate story. Chilean like, yeah, big cave. news story in like 2018, if you remember. Um, because it's the kids in the coach, right? That are stuck. yeah, the kids in the coach get stuck. That movie is just so steady, so calm, and Vigo's doing some of the best work of his career. Joel Edgerton is probably giving his career best performance. I did. I will say I have not seen the movie, but I've watched to bring this back. Colin Farrell kicking ass in that movie. I I didn't see the movie, but I saw the National Geographic documentary that featured the real divers. And that was a really good documentary. I heard it was good. Yeah. I'm just saying as someone who hates Ron Howard and thinks he's a terrible director, uh, 13 lives starring Viggo Mortensen is like quietly a great movie. (laughs) All right. I'm going to have to check this so out. So at the end of the sixth you day, it, I'm sure after the barn scene, Fraser prays that night. Yes. He says a few quick prayers. This is another like mid prayer. We cut to Soprano style seventh day. Yeah. I forgot to make my joke again earlier, but the, the transition while he is masturbating is we cut mid beat to the next day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I made that joke earlier and I wanted to. It was, good, it was a good joke. It was a good joke. It was a good joke. So funny. seventh day, which this is where we should be again, if, 
if we were led to believe of the biblical parallel of the creation and seventh days, this should be where something crazy like happens that like is a climactic moment, but it really well, isn't. But it, I mean, well, it has some big moments, but it's not like it's not obviously seventh the, days, the day of rest, right? Is the is 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 I would I would correct you there. The sixth day is where everything comes together. Right. If we if you want to map that out. Sure. The seventh day everything's done. And God's just like, all right, I'm gonna chill for a minute. Yeah, it's the Sabbath. And so on the seventh day we get Jude, who I guess that's what this is when we find out what Jude does, that he's like he's just a the, guy who he's transport- the courier for the, the for the coffins. Yeah. That clay the, Callie and Clay sell coffins to the town. Yeah. And this preacher shows up with who is a mortician. A mortician. Yeah. Uh, a, a thing that we haven't noted that I think should be noted, there are only eight people in this movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> until, so, until the circus shows up at the end, there are only eight people in this movie and so no extras. This was something that I wanted to point out on the seventh day. Because okay. when Quincy the mortician and Jew the coffin transporter guys show up, I wrote this down like this gives me play vibes because yeah. it it is it, it's inter- we talked about how Philip Ridley very much like has a lot of experience in like the theatrical playwright world. This entire I won't say this entire movie feels like a play. It doesn't. Um, there's a lot of more cinematic esque moments that are very uniquely cinematic. But especially when they're at the house at the front yard or maybe around the barn, it feels very play. Just like at the moment Quincy and Jude get out, it, like all that the dia- the fast p- paced dialogue and the one camera, it was not. I think it was not a one shot, but it was like kind of like a handheld steady or something, just like showing I mean, all the there, beats. There is there is motion and there is length. There there is camera motion and there is a length of shot. Yes, that is not been present in the movie up until this point. And it gave me a lot of play vibes because yes. it's that uninterrupted visual. Of the people in the scene, yeah, whose business is to just talk. Most it stops a different visual style because it's people from the outside world coming into this, right? And I mean, disrupting this but, even more. But more so, it, it, it's it's a visual style that feels like is coded as realistic. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because I think I think that sense of theatricality that you're you're pointing to, it's not theatricality in the sense of like being artificial. It's theatricality in the sense be more realistic that 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 it's about this sense of people existing in the same physical space together, having conversations in real time that is of a piece with how actual real human interaction. Yeah. And live theater. Yeah, and, and live theater, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's the and like it's just reality constantly intruding more and more upon this imagined space. Yeah, um, but this is when we get a private moment with Jude in Darkly because Jude immediately notices um, he notices Darkly looking at Callie. Yeah, and he kind of gives him the whole like, "Hey, why don't we go talk for a second on a cliffside?" Yeah, Mealy thought. I immediately thought Jude was going to fucking kill Jude in this scene. Yeah, Jude was going to kill Darkly. No, Darkly was going to kill Jude. Oh, yes. I totally got those vibes of, like, just, I don't know. Like, I I don't know what would have caused it, but I got a lot of vibes of, like, Jude Jude and Darkly were going to get into an argument, which they almost kind of do, but then it sort of diffuses. And so, but Jude and Darkly have a conversation about Callie, and they're like, hey, like, Basically, kind of say, "Hey, hide your boner, bro." Yeah, more or less is what he's telling. Like he says, Clay is a man of tremendous anger. Yeah, he can be, and so like, don't mistake her hospitality for anything else. Right, because it it will be poor. It will end poorly for you. Right, and then he gives him a fossilized dinosaur poop. Yeah, and and uh, darkly in it, something that's kind of brushed off. He's like, dinosaurs don't exist. He says that. Mm, he, he, yes. He basically says, like, dinosaurs don't exist. They can't have existed because God created the world in seven days, 3,000 years ago. I he doesn't totally say exactly that, but he, it's very that. thrown off where he's I just totally like, well, dinosaurs don't exist. totally missed that. He's like, dinosaurs don't exist. And um, wow. I think Clay, I think, uh, I can't believe I missed what's that his part. name? Oh, my God, Jude. Jude. It's just like, well, some Brachiosaurus shit that out a few thousand years ago, so I don't know what you want me to tell you. 
Wow, I totally missed that part. Yeah. I I thought he was, I thought he was not believing that it was actual dinosaur because yeah, because not that darkly is students. darkly keeps getting these visuals of like time that should not exist according to his beliefs, which is like. You know, the Native American cave drawings and the handprint that's been there for thousands of years. An unmarried man and woman living together. Yeah, like a di- mm-hmm. di- a dinosaur egg, all these things of time, like, continuing on. Yeah. That, to, in his belief, shouldn't exist. Right. Can I loop back to something for a yes. second? Yeah. Do you guys think that description of Cal is accurate? Which, uh, that, oh, that he's a that man of anger. he is this, like, like, dangerous man in a way. We never that, that really he, see it. Exactly. I don't I, I don't know that I buy it. And I think to some degree it's another sense of like like I said, narrativization of, of reality. Yeah. That that it's this idea people have about him that has very little bearing, but we're seeing it from the other side now mm-hmm. in a way. Because like Cal gets I, taken he out seems by very Darkly. peaceful. Yeah. Well, I would say Clay and it, it's clay, but uh, clay, Sorry, clay, clay does like fight off darkly at the first aggressive scene. Yeah. But then when the darkly comes back full, you know, Diablo style, <laughs> you know, he's very quickly like yeah, overpowered. He very quickly dispatched by darkly. Yeah. So, but uh, do you do you do you think the scene where they fight is necessarily like clay being quick to anger? No, no, no exactly. It's just very and to like, go back, Jeff, to your Frankenstein analogy. Like, it, it is kind of a similar thing. He's mute. Yeah. He's tall and he's mute and he lives out in the woods. And so people think, well, he must be monstrous. Yeah. He's just, he must he right. must have this temper. You know, he's just like a guy and he gets depressed sometimes and walks in the yeah. woods to sort it all out. Yeah. We've all done that. We've all done that. Yeah, yeah. every week. Yeah. Um, but so then it's that night that darkly sees clay and Callie have sex. Yeah. And I think this is like the moment when the whole false reality comes shattering down. Yeah. Cause now he's like, he's now like faced all angles of no if and or about that. There is nothing there between him and Callie. Yeah. And there never was something there. And so that's when he goes into his darkly forest walk and falls asleep in the woods. Yes. Um, and that's where we see, I, we've been saying this out of context, and I don't know how the audience have been able to keep up, but this is where we see the shiny shoe float the down the river. The big old shoe. So he wakes it, it up. It is a giant bedazzled. bedazzled shoe. Yeah. Single shoe. And by giant, I mean massive. Because you it, see a crow it, on top it, of it. I feel like the, the 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 height of the shoe, like the ankle, it's like three feet, parts or something like that. Is like I, I think it's even maybe even bigger. They fit yeah. a dead dog in there later. Like yeah, they That's fit true. a dead dog in there. Like it's it is a very large shoe, and it is just drifting down this river in the middle of. We the get this incredible angelic music at this point, and a well, really interesting long shot reverse shot of. Of darkly from darkly's perspective, looking at the shoe, and it's just literally on a tripod panning with the shoe going around the river. Because they, whatever location they found this in, it was like the perfect bend, where like literally you could start with the camera looking left, and all I had to do was just pan right, and you could see the shoe flow all the way down across the bend where it disappears. I will. I will also say I think that's the only time in the movie where you have this very geometric steady pan. Yeah, very steady. Like they're they're. they're there is not a whole lot of camera movement in this movie, but when it is, it's either like, and like we said, it, it's catered, but like the gunfight scene is handheld. The, the, the play like scene with the, the undertaker is very much a steady cam. This is a very much a like lockdown on a tripod panning across a physical space. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really the only time it happens in the movie. And the reverse shot is, they probably put it on like a barge or something, something mm-hmm. that was very stable yeah. because that one is just literally like arcing around looking at 
uh, darkly yeah. from a wide angle. It's the only time we get like direct, uninterrupted POV and it's for so such long. a long period of time. Yeah. It's so long. It may only be like a minute. I don't know. I found that scene very effective. But, but for this movie, it's... It's so it's such a break, I think, from the editing rhythms as well. Yeah, yeah that like yeah. it feels so long, which which gives it this sort of sense of import. What did it mean? Well, this is what I this is my read. I mean, Darkly thinks it's a miracle. Yeah, okay. I don't think Darkly necessarily knows what it means, but he's clearly parsing it as um, an act of God. And we can get into the end of the movie if you want to, but it doesn't mean anything. He's just trying. It's him fi- trying to find meaning in a chaotic yeah, it's, world. Yeah, it's again, it's him seeing this thing that he can't explain, and rather than accept that there's not a good explanation for it, he just presumes divinity. Which do you want to just say what it is? Should we say what it is now? Yeah, it's a, it's a, from a circus. Yeah, like- yeah at, at at the very end of the movie. We, we find out that there's been a circus family who's been lost in the woods and that they're like barge set barge yeah. overturned or whatever. And that they, they had for some reason they had a giant shoe and they lost a giant shoe. And you can say that's dumb, but it's like I said earlier, real life is quirks. Real life is peculiarities and those peculiarities don't need to make narrative sense. Yes. And the idea that there is just a circus here and they had a shoe and it's devoid of any inherent meaning but darkly and also us, almost more so us as the spectator want to prescribe meaning onto it and therefore darkly also wants to My prescribe pe- We people love it. putting meaning on things. Yeah. And it's upsetting Why would there to us be a when shoe? things there don't There has to be a meaning. reason for there to be a shoe. And it's no well, accident no, that right after this scene is when he meets Roxy who fills his head with all Grace, the more... Zabriskie, solo, yes. card, billing. <laughs> Pl- basically playing Mrs. Palmer from Twin Peaks. Very similar One energy. Of the best character actresses of all time. She's tremendous. She's the best. She's so terrifying. And um, have you guys seen fucking uh, Inland Empire? I've actually, it's one of the few Lynch's no. I haven't seen. Uh-oh. She's in like two minutes of Inland Empire and it's like the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> It's right at the beginning, too. It was basically the trailer for Inland Empire was her scene in Inland Empire. Mm-hmm. Have you seen Inland Empire, Stuart? No. Oh, God. She's Inland incredible in Twin Peaks. She's great in Twin Peaks. She's great in everything. Oh, dang, Jeff, you know what she's in? What? She's in The Judge. Oh, she is in The Judge. You've seen The I've Judge? I've seen The Judge. I've Why se- would you watch The Judge? Because I had to watch it. Ugh. You had to judge it. Horrid. But so, Stuart, you like The Judge? I haven't 50, seen it. Fifty percent of that movie is time. Robert Downey Jr. running around trying to find out if he accidentally has a child. I I haven't seen it. Uh, uh, no, 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 Jeff. I I know what happens to the judge. That is not a good description of that subplot. I need you to clarify for Stuart what that actually means. Robert Downey Jr. thinks he had a affair. Oh my god, it's been I cannot remember what happens in the judge. He thinks he, he, thinks had, he had, a, had an affair. He with, has a one night stand with a woman, and then he, with like a woman half his age, and then he is presented with like some evidence that suggests that she might be an Ill- illegitimate child. He never knew he had. Yes. Okay, that's it. He has so enough- that, that, that subplot is actually Robert Downey Jr. running around town trying to figure out if he did incest. <laughs> yes. He has sex with like a 20 year old girl and then finds out that she might be his child. Robert Downey Jr. produced that movie. He spends most of the movie being like, so like, did when we slept together, like, did this girl come from that? Like, crazy movie. Very strange movie. Stuart's going to fucking kill me when he realizes how long we've been recording. (laughs) Oh, I know how long we've been recording. (laughs) For uh, it's only actually been like an hour and a half, I think. Oh, because we had to do like eight hours of test records. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, we did, which we unfortunately lost. I mean, it's just five minutes of nonsense. It was, it was good discussion. It was Stuart telling a very interesting. Would story you rather be five minutes of nonsense or two of hours of what we've been talking about right now? Yeah. Oh no, I agree. I agree. <laughs> um. So anyway, uh, this is a um. So this is we're with Roxy. Yeah. And um Roxy on the road. immediately they connect. Roxy for she the takes Darkly to her trailer. Roxy for the Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. 
Um, <laughs> thank Jeff. Thank you. Um, and right away, she's giving him all of the the small town tea. Yes. Where it's like Callie's a witch. Oh yeah, she's a witch. Um, and first, she's like, like, yes. She charmed my husband into falling into temptation with her, and then killed him, and then charmed my son and stole him from me, and kicked me out of the house. So and darkly eats all this up yeah he loves it he's like oh my god like oh yeah it makes all sense now like oh yeah um and also just just to associate because i kind of touched on this at the start of the record um if if callie's house is like golden and amber um the cave is mostly orange yeah and uh what's roxy's house is blue yeah and and that's that color palette starts off subtle and over the course of the second half of the movie it is going to just turn into like a straight up gel placed over the lens yeah, yeah. and it's like it's like the orange and teal conflict of the two most yeah. opposing colors yeah and so after all this is said um darkly goes back to Callie's barn and this is where we get the bit where he has the barbed wire bird which previously in the trailer uh, roxy explains to him the meaning of the the bird with the barbed wire because she want the dog so fucking diseased when you said me on the trailer i was like did you watch the trailer to this movie hmm? you said me previously in the trailer and i'm so diseased i thought you were like watch the trailer for this movie and they explained it no i know i, mean, I know okay. in her trailer yeah. so she explains to him like uh, yeah the bird i put barbed wire inside so the dog would learn to like pick it up with a soft mouth which sucks, but you got to do it to train the dog. Because the dog is a hunting dog, right. theoretically. Theoretically. And so that it, then that carries into the next scene where he's at the barn at night. He has the bird with the barbed wire, and then he just squeezes it. And that is, I would say, probably the beginning of Darkly's like, transformation. or Not transformation, but like his tactic into how he's going to quote unquote resist Callie's curse temptation. What mm. have you? I, I don't think transformation is that bad of a word considering the last 10 minutes. Of this well, sure. Yeah. Uh, he's not trying to transform himself though. He, he's trying to do is he's putting up all these guards, these barricades that yes. like, uh, I don't know why I thought of this, but like the Da Vinci code, the one who's the fucking guy who keeps whipping himself in the back. And he puts sh- Paul Bettany. Yeah, Paul Bettany. What I it, saw that movie, and once. he like wears like a belt of it's sharp. a Ron Howard movie. Yeah, but like it, it's sort of that same vein of like you need to be in like constant like pain to resist from the outside temptations because it will constantly I mean, remind you. Yes, and like when later he unravels the bird and like basically wraps himself in barbed wire. Yeah. That he then leaves in for most of the sec- the last third of the movie. He is, he is like very much like first reformed. He has done this like prostrating self mutilation thing, of um, like wrapping himself in barbed wire and cutting himself, and it's shot so similarly to the masturbation scene. Yeah, early on, like these quick cuts, these tight close ups. It's all self, um, self and literally a bodily fluids being spilled. Yeah, what's also interesting is this was all the seventh day. And it jumps to the ninth. It skips the eighth day. I miss that. That's yeah, good. does it? I'm glad you wrote down all the day patterns here. It, it skipped the eighth day. Fascinating. And I was trying my best to keep good tabs on like when it's jump days, and like I never got an eighth day title card. It <laughs> just went straight into. Now, what I think might have happened is, um, the, when it says this is seventh day, and he. After Callie and Clay have sex, he wanders in the woods and falls asleep. There's no eighth day title card, but it's still the next day. So there is an eighth day, but we don't present it as the eighth day. And that would be the only day, at least within the text of the movie, that he spends completely outside of of the house. Callie's influence. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's pretty good. Oh, that's a good that's a good observation. (laughs) Okay. So I'm just rattling through it, but on the ninth day, and then Callie, we just cut to a scene where Callie is tending to the wounds. There's no like explanation where he like comes up to Callie and opens up his palms or anything. It's just immediately, like, you know, tending to his wounds. Um, 
and she does him like, you know, you got to be extra careful and all that stuff, but, you know, more motherly influence yeah. and all that. This is where I feel like we get a slightly more objective view of Callie mm-hmm. because uh, at least in this part, uh, Darkly is so like, he's so like self punishing himself to not fall into Callie's like temptationness, And so we just see, we don't see Callie like, like if this was the beginning of the movie, then it would not have just been her wrapping his hands. It would have been her wrapping his hands and wearing something very skimpy and like sitting on his lap or some shit like mm-hmm. that. That's what it would have been like if it was the beginning of the movie. But this one, it's literally just her being like, you got to be more careful. Yeah. Like, don't wander out too far and all that kind of stuff. I wrote two notes in my notebook at this point. I wrote one that said, editing is fun. And I don't know what I'm referring to. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then I wrote one that's incredible split diopter, which is. Okay. Okay. Yes. Cole, I, I don't activated think when I said split diopter. I don't think it's a split diopter. You don't? I don't. You think it's composite? I think it's a split screen. Slick. I Go think on. it's a split screen meant to look like the most intense split diopter shot of all time. It, and I'll explain why. Well, do you want to explain the shot since you clearly got excited about it? I did get excited about it, and yeah. you're about to wreck my shit. When did the split? Yeah. When did the split screen split diopter part it's happen? Basically, he's deciding to walk out, like around. He's he's time. he's standing outside of the house, and it's. Do I need to explain? Do we need to explain a split diopter shot to this audience? Do we no, think no. no? Okay, the 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 focal difference is so intense that. Like he's essentially he's, if this is the lens, he's here and she's like yeah. back where that chair and, is. And Judd is backgrounded. And the focal difference is so intense that the background in Fraser's half of the shot is completely out of focus. Like normally in a split diopter shot, it would be a little out of focus if you didn't hide it well. But this is clearly like not even trying to to correct it. Here's why I think it's a split screen. Because I, 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 I paused it and I studied it for a long time. I think he, that shot of Fraser, he's standing in the woods. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's the house behind him. I think those are trees behind him. And it's so out of focus, you get caught up in thinking it's a split diopter. But I think he's already gone mentally. Cole, I will say, I, I'm, I give this movie a lot of credit. Yeah. I don't know if I would give it that much credit. It is easier to do a fake split diopter shot than it is to do a real split diopter shot, first of all. I'm just going to put that out there. Yes. You guys know this. Yes, yeah. it's, it's significantly yeah. easier to just film two things and then splice it down. Yeah, there. exactly. Like I and, and it's just, I just think... But do you think it's the intention to, like, for the filmmaker to be like, oh, he's in the woods? Everything in a movie is intentional. Uh, I don't believe yes. that. Yes, everything in a movie is intentional. Are, you're in. You're saying in a movie, like it's jet universal. Yes. No, that's yes. No. Yes. No. Someone had to put it in there. Uh, yeah, because we don't have any other takes. <laughs> that's that. There's intentionality to that. Well, but okay. There, there's but never anything hair. to be gained from sitting here and being like, "But was this purposeful? It was purposeful." Even if it was an accident, it's a purposeful to keep it in. Yes. Uh, I mean, all right. There are a lot of happy accents, but it's per intent to we get. We call it a happy accident, but I, I, I don't. I think it's included like included in the movie for a reason. I, I think it could easily be like, well, like, hey, Philip, this is the editor talking. Like, he's clearly not in front of the house. He's by the woods. Like, well, the audience isn't going to know any different. I don't know that he's in the woods. I think he's in the woods. It's so out of focus that you can't tell what he's standing in front of. Looking sure. at color patterns and like the vague hints of shapes you get, I think he's in the woods and not in front of the house. Okay, he's so far removed. That's my point. I make. I mean, regardless, it's it's meant to be that he's gone, right? There. Right? Yeah. These are. But you there's can't a... see the house behind him, regardless of him right or not. I just think they shot a close up of Fraser in the woods and composited them together. Then they're so far. Regardless, it accomplished yeah. the goal. They're so far removed from exactly at this point. So, um, such a good shot. There's a few things that I have written down here and I might've like jumbled some things up between the ninth and the 10th day, but it's the, uh, the ninth day is where he wraps his entire body in barbed wire. 
And before that, it's when he not conf- he doesn't confront Callie about the story, but he sort of lets it slip about, well, didn't you charm what happened to Clay's dad or something like that? Like he sort of just lets it slip out. And that's when Callie says, no, like, Lee, you need to understand. It's like Clay's father tried to rape me and suffered a heart attack and died. Mm-hmm. It's not that I did anything with him. And and that, and that, I agree. Hearing that come from Callie, it's like, yeah, that's like a thousand percent more believable than yeah. he charmed him <laughs> with temptation. magical abilities. Yeah. And so that's when he wraps himself in barbed wire, presumably from where I interpret it is – is because it's such a good argument he's again just all the more trying to like resist Callie's what he would argue as charm or magic but what really is is her truth yeah is he's trying to be like he's trying to ignore Callie's truth and to just only see what he wants to see and so that's when we get the 10th day I I wrote down just a little general note a few things um, this movie definitely had vision in all aspects of its making. I, I think everything was intentional. I, 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 I would say <laughs> the diopter shot. <laughs> I, I didn't catch. I, I, I didn't see. I don't see any with wherewithal to whether you interpret he's in the woods or by the house any differently in my intention in my perspective you if you want to interpret it that way that's cool i'm um, you know if it adds an additional layer for the movie to you that's cool you can have the point cole you can have the point you can have the point i don't care but uh, the score is me too steward zero oh, sure <laughs> wait where's the first point uh, the winning the argument about uh, the bald look in um, taking the home. Uh, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Back up, back up, sidebar. What? Yeah. The bald look in, in what? The, it, the hair. Oh, Our my. hair argument. He's not even bald, though. It's like yeah, buzz. He's basically bald. <laughs> no. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Check the hair ranking, Cole. Check check the hair ranking. I, I know the people's hair ranking. <laughs> <laughs> the people's hair ranking. Also, Stuart, oh. if oh no. If you won that argument, then why do I have two points? <laughs> <laughs> That's not an argument. That's not an argument. That's not a rebuttal. Anyway. Jeff. Anyway. Am no, I right? No, no. I what so what oh, I know he's offering some compelling points what here. I, what but... I was arguing was like now. every <laughs> wait, of, wait. of the camera movement. Stuart, you just lost another point. The lighting, all the acting performance decisions, and the set design I felt were all extremely intentional. And so, uh, good or bad, good or bad, they're all intentional. Well, I mean, I feel like sometimes we hash out this notion of good and bad, especially when we're talking about you know, visual aesthetic stuff. And I would include um, editing in visual aesthetic stuff here. Um, I think a lot of times we have this conversation of like, what's good, what's bad in terms of aesthetic beauty, Mm -hmm. which is kind of a defeating way to look at it. And I guess this is kind of what I was getting at with like, oh, is any individual decision in this movie good? I don't know, but it all works towards the greater piece. Is like, this movie's very ugly in so many ways. Yeah. Right. But it's such an, like, an intentional and interesting and artistic grotesqueness. And the shoe fits. And the shoe fits that I'm like, well, why would point. you ever waste your time being like, but this could be prettier? I mean, I'm sorry. I This is a dumb argument to get into. Uh, when the movie hasn't even come out yet, but everyone who's bitching about the color grading of women talking is a moron and doesn't know what they're talking about and just wants movies to be pretty. Uh, ugliness is a choice. Ugliness is a choice. This is a very ugly movie um, in a way that I think like hints at beauty in a very interesting way because it's so manicured. Love song you know for Bobby saying? Long. Very ugly movie. But Stuart loves that fucking movie. I love a love song for Bobby Long. 
No, you don't. Yes, I do. Nobody what? likes a love song for. It's like his favorite movie that it's we've like covered one on of the my show. That's insane. Of one of You've my talked movies. about the taking of Pelham one, two, three. Uh, yeah, and love song wins. That's insane. You've talked about hairspray. <laughs> yeah, and love song wins. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's like his favorite movie we've covered. That's fucking garbage. I bought him when a did DVD you of a Golden. Perfect. When did you become a Golden Globe voter? <laughs> hey, uh, did that? Yeah, that's right. I know that movie got a Golden Globe nomination. It did, it didn't did. it? For I believe Scarlett Johansson. Yeah, she's fucking great in that movie. I'm looking it up. But Travolta also does a really good performance. Yeah, th- uh, yeah. Well, Scarlett Johansson did get nominated for the Golden Globe for this movie. Love song for Bob. Understandably so. I completely Scarlett forgot Johansson's that happened. I forgot we talked about that. Right movie. off the coattails of Lost in Translation. So I do. Oh, no, yeah, no. It makes it makes a million percent chance. Also, right off the coattails of the movie she should have an Oscar for. Right. Which is Ghost World. Well, yeah. I, I was going to say the SpongeBob SquarePants movie, but. Right. All right. Back to Dark Mindy, Moon. Mindy, the um, of the Sea. This is where we get to the last 30 minutes. And a lot is happening. I didn't take too many notes. Um, so, because it gets a little foggy, but this is where, like, after the barbed wire gets wrapped and we get to, like, the 30, like, the, well, the last 30 minutes of this movie. Shit. Stuart is closing the notebook. Up, I'm folks. closing. It's up all the, from memory now. It's closing up the all notebook. Off the cuff. It is all. We're all in batshit crazy world because yes. I'm trying to think. I think after the barbed wire scene is when yes, the the fake split diopter scene is when he walks out. He leaves. I don't know it's fake. Just to clarify, okay. I just think it's fake. And I think it, it also right before that scene is when he approaches Callie in an aggressive manner. Yeah, because and he's starting to get visions of his dead parents that are telling him that are filling his head with stuff that he's already telling himself. Well, he doesn't get the vision of the parents until after he leaves. Right. Because he, that's after he leaves. The dog dies. Yes. And they have that funeral on the shoe. Yeah. Roxy's dog dies. They put it in the shoe, light it on fire and give it a Viking funeral. Well, beforehand, which it was is when... this kind of incoherent religious gesture in a way, because yes, because I, I think this is important. She feels the need to do something, but darkly is insistent that animals don't have souls. Yeah. And right. therefore it doesn't matter. So they kind of invent this semi pagan third party, like way to appease both of them in their sense of faith while using this, like, potentially miraculous object yeah as the vehicle for it yeah mm, again vehicle. prescribing meaning onto meaninglessness yeah yeah and so yeah that that but right before that was when we got the scene where darkly is like a he's, he's not like showing per se like aggression towards Callie. it's just the way his i feel like that's the scene Talk about the scene when he approaches Callie and Clay fights him off. Yeah. He seems, you said Frankenstein's monster, and I think it's so good here because this is after he's wrapped himself in barbed wire. He's so stocky, and just the way he moves towards Callie reads like a threat. Yeah. And it's nothing, he doesn't say anything, he doesn't raise a hand, he just walks towards Callie. But that's enough for both Callie and Clay to feel threatened by him. Mm Mm-hmm. Because of how much his nature has changed, how much his soul has changed, that it exu- it expels out from him that he is like a different person at yeah. this point. I'd like to put a brief pin and just say that I have a hot take that I want to discuss at the end of this episode. Continue. Okay. All right, keep going. Well, so that that was just the a little bit where yeah. after Clay punches him and he falls down on the ground he gets up and he reveals to Callie that he has accidentally barbed, the barbed wire the, the barbed wires wrapped around him and yeah. she I don't know if this is a good performance maybe it is maybe it isn't but it was just the way that Callie like grotesquely like squealed at that was like get out of here like it's just no more, it's good it turned into like an animal like how you would tell an animal to get yeah I I'm not quite sure I uh, would nominate either Fraser or Judd for an Oscar this year, but I'm looking at my 95 ballot, and they would probably be sixth place. 
in their respective categories. They're both incredible in this. Yeah. So that's when he runs away, grabs his stuff. He get we get to the dog, the dead dog scene. Yeah. And then um, we have the dog burial, or not the burial, but the burning, like the the barge burning on the bedazzled shoe. We get the the hallucination of the parents, the dead parents telling him things that he already knows. Um, I can't remember when at this point, but Roxy kills herself. She shoots herself in the yes. head with a rifle. So here's something about Roxy shooting herself in the head with a rifle is we get this very lengthy sequence of her preparing to do it, right? Like going yeah. through the very belabored degrees of setup. So we and we, we we really get to like spend time in this space. Yeah. And then when she pulls the trigger, it's a hard cut to Fraser darkly doing like the sort of, you know, waking up from a nightmare thing. Yeah. And that people rocks. do and he's he's in the cave and it's like a pure hellscape in the cave yeah and when he does go so it, the the editing there codes it as some sort of a vision right mm -hmm. and what i think is interesting is when he goes to the house and Stuart, you're gonna tell me i'm being an asshole here but when he goes to the house and finds roxy's dead body the way her body is lying is 5% impossible for how we had seen her set up the shotgun. No, I agree. That's 100%. It's, okay, thank you. It is, it is just a The geography hair, of the trailer doesn't match up. The geography, but but it, 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 it so subtly doesn't match up. Yes, I agree. 100%. That, that there, there's, again, this sense of Did like, you notice well, this, Jeff? Yes, I did, actually. Because, okay, like, thank you. I'm not crazy. It, yeah. No, so and I'm going to paint it for the audience so, so the audience understands. And it might seem I'm going through a geography yeah, it's, lesson. It's but bear be with hard me. to describe. <laughs> so if you imagine the trailer like a rectangle and the door and, like, divide the rectangle in half. And on the right side of the rectangle is the bedroom. And the left side is, like, the kitchen, living room, entrance door. She loads the gun and does the shooting by the entrance door half of the trailer. So, like, because in the background, like, if it's a profile shot, right? Yeah. It's a close-up profile of her toe going on the trigger. What's in the background? The door, mm -hmm. at least to the outside, which is on the left-hand side of the trailer. Mm -hmm. But when Darkly walks in, not only is she, like, she should be on her back, her head parallel with the door, her feet leading into the bedroom on the floor. Instead, she's on the bed, her feet are facing the left side, and her head is angled towards the right wall. And she's also at a hard diagonal. Yes. Whereas yes. before she had been like very explicitly like parallel with the door. Per, per parallel with the walls of the trailer. Yes. Okay. I'm thank you. I'm, I'm glad uh, we all <laughs> caught this. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. I caught but, that. Too. But again, there is this sense that like clearly. I don't know if we're we're to meant that he gets a vision. Maybe he hears the gunshot. Like I don't know necessarily how we're supposed to parse him understanding that she's killed herself. Nor do I necessarily think the movie cares so much. What it cares is that the sort of mediation of this moment mm. is is told to us that it exists as a fantasy. That that when we see her death again we see darkly's imagining of how she did it yes. now this, and that's not truth this is an example of what i can perceive as a happy continuity accident that they used and actually contorted into something with actual meaning in it because it, like it could easily, it could easily, it could easily, it could have been, it, it could have been easily have been, but, but they shot it in two separate days. The first day yeah. was her killing herself scene. And then the next day was him discovering the body. And it could have been when they shot the scene or killing herself, they were like, okay, so this is how we're going to frame it. And they, they blocked the rehearsal and she was by the door and they shot all those tight close up profile shots. And then when they showed up the next day, they're like, okay, where is her body? Yeah, and then they may have decided right, right over there, right on the bed, diagonal. So when or something like that, when I say everything in a movie is intentional, the the pushback you gave me earlier, 
mm-hmm. when I said that earlier. It's yeah. the pushback I get from a lot of people, which is that like, well, things go wrong on the set and sometimes you don't have the best material to choose from. You have to make do with what you do. Yeah. To use this as an example, if you are correct, Stuart, you may very well be that this is a continuity error. We don't need, as audience members, we do not need to see the body to understand that he has found her body. Sure. Even if this is a scenario where they fucked up and they couldn't reshoot it, that they put it in the movie anyway denotes meaning. And the juxtaposition of it denotes meaning. And that's why I I don't really care to try to parse out, It's well, what happened on set because what happened on set was ultimately decided to be of a piece with the work. It it's uh it's fabricated meaning. Yeah. But all movies are fabricated meaning. But some that's some go back meanings, to fucking Kuleshov here. But listen, meanings what I mean like it had an intention and meaning, I mean like you start with the script on paper and you circle a line in the action and you say, Oh, like Clay gets up from the chair and looks at Callie. All and then meaning- as a director, you can circle that line and be like, All right, we're gonna shoot it like this on the day so it denotes this meeting. And you show up on set, shoot it that way, and it falls into the edit the way that you intended it to uh, be. All meaning is ultimately derived in the editing room. I that I don't think meaning, that's true, meaning is derived from juxtaposition and shot. Then how do you explain one shot films? Oh my goodness! Like nineteen seventeen or film Birdman is a film that has been edited. A one shot film on has set. been edited on set. Yes, that is the editing room in that scenario. Have you heard and, of the phrase no, 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 no. "shoot no, 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 for no, no, the no. edit"? Because a one shot film has multiple takes, and you choose the best take. Okay. But that's mo- not a creative meaning. That's like logistical, objective performance. Which is a form of creating meaning. And also deciding to do it in in a I'm single take is deciding when that take begins and when that take ends and allowing for a sort of spontaneity. That is still an edited choice. But can we at least... This is why I say lives, anything live can't be cinema. Can we at least agree that there are different forms of meaning as one that is fabricated at the last minute uh, notion in the editing room versus one that has been planned from the development stage into its finality? Uh, pl- planning is meaningless. Because because then again, all dogs is planned to be an R-rated because, because movie, and it let, came let out let as me, PG. Let me let me let me let me actually kind of correct what I said earlier. Meaning is created in the editing room and meaning is created upon reception. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. The, 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 the film, the, the, the relationship between the film and the spectator is a dialectical one that, that creates meaning vis-a-vis how each individual spectator is going to parse what is seen on screen. To say that, oh, well, this was a thing that was planned doesn't matter because what ultimately matters is how it is received. I think we're getting three words kind of like jumbled up here that some share definitions, but are in my view, a little bit different Mm. is intention. Meaning meaning is received. Meaning is received. Intention, meaning and interpretation. And I totally hear that you could have a movie from womb to tomb from the moment the page is printed out of the copy machine to the moment the director says that's the final edit that they have an intention to have a certain aspect mean something but it completely gets flipped upside down once it gets interpreted by the audience you're also not going to like what I'm about to say okay. what does it mean to intend something what does it mean to what intend something do we truly know what our intentions are as artists? Oh my God. I'm serious. You are right, Cole. I am going to be mad at you. No, I'm serious. <laughs> like, 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 so, like, like okay. What does it like, mean no, to, no, like, no, no. I'll have this conversation with you. Let's go two and a half hours. Let's fucking go. Okay. So, <laughs> Jeff is getting on his phone, which you're not going to hear Cole's side know, of the argument. Okay. No, no, no. Let's have this conversation. Okay. So, if I'm to believe that. It's that it's totally worthless to at least have a blueprint 
in tow before you even get to the film set of how you're going to like it's the foundation for everything a director decides on like take any take more take any the movie more than, take the movie any more than what they had for breakfast listen, that morning take the movie <laughs> network okay yeah it's and fine. in the movie I, i'm pretty sure it's network it's uh Sorry, give me one. We got to the best part of this movie. And okay. <laughs> to so to argue take, at take, take the movie network, all right? So Sidney Lumet um, said, um, I'm trying to think, is it network? I might be thinking of a different movie, actually. I mean, if you want to bring Lumet into the example, I will kneecap you immediately. Well, give me, like, hold <laughs> because on. Because I, 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 Sidney I, Lumet, I'm if you to... want to say... Sidney Lumet on. intended no. anything. No, I'm thinking of a different movie. Like, I'm sorry. I've read Making Movies. It's a very Same good here. book. Same I here, I don't bro. think Sidney Lumet knows what he's doing. Uh, okay. That's... And, and by that, I don't mean Sidney Lumet is an idiot. I mean, I have read Sidney Lumet lay out his process, and I do not think Sidney Lumet has a, like, cognitive understanding of what he is doing as an artist. Okay. It's actually like I, I truly like you you talk to me about like Sidney Lumet, the guy who spends like three pages in that book saying the auteur theory is bullshit because he, Sidney Lumet, has never repeated himself once. When every Sidney Lumet movie is the exact same thing. Sorry, I'm still like trying that to is look a up. guy who is entirely working I'm, okay. off of instinct. And subliminal so, ideas here's the thing, and Cole. memory. If uh, <laughs> like if if I was gonna make a movie about uh, like surveillance and the idea that nothing you say is hidden, and I had sure. to think about what my intention is for this movie, and that is sure. to break apart the idea of privacy. Sure, that's the theme. Okay. It's breaking apart the idea of privacy. Okay, okay. So here's the thing. If I, I have to I decide, quickly, okay, if I have to decide, if I have to decide in a scene where a character walks down an alleyway and it's raining, and I have the choice between a solid black umbrella or a transparent umbrella, I'm picking yes. the transparent umbrella because that speaks to more of the transparency that's l lack thereof of privacy. Yes. Why is it raining? Because we need an umbrella. <laughs> Is that is that really all it is? Like you said, like. But this is more fabricated meaning, though. I I know, but but when we say this is fa meaning is fabricated meaning is fabricated in many ways, and you said like, oh, I want to make a movie with this theme. Why does a movie have a theme? Why do movies not have a million themes? Some movies We've do. We've latched onto an understanding of the passion of Darkly Noon. Is that the only thing this movie's about? No, this movie's about a lot of things. This movie is about the weirdness of Brendan Fraser's body. Every, this movie is about how hot Ashley Judd. Every and, movie uh, is about a lot of and, different things to a lot of Viggo different Mortensen people. Are. That's like, the this interpretation, movie is about though. The shape of a forest. But this is where interp interpretation comes from. And I know That's you said, what like, saying. what? What is interpretation? I think you guys kind of agree. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think because you guys kind I don't of agree. agree with this nonsense that intention and meaning don't really exist. I totally disagree with That's that. That's the argument of this movie. <laughs> That's what this movie's trying to no, say. I mean, thank you. That is kind of one of the arguments of this movie. <laughs> but also, like. Intention doesn't mean anything because you're assuming people are right about their intentions, that their intentions are the alpha and the omega of everything, that other people don't also have intentions, that, again, that people are consciously making every choice they're making, I'm, which they aren't. I'm not saying attention is the cross to die on when it comes to how you receive a movie, good or bad. I'm saying intention is a director's toolkit on how to guide a movie so to be interpreted in a few different ways but because if so you don't if you can have <laughs> intention if you can have intention with a meaning and a theme that can when it gets released can be interpreted in 10 different ways okay fine i'll give you that but if you go from the release, onset if you go from the onset of no intention and no meaning then you go from a thousand different interpretations and it's just muddiness that nobody knows what the movie is
Exactly. <laughs> he's not he good. Okay, okay, That's okay. Not here's, good. Wait, here's, here's my problem. Here's my problem. And this is a, a direct. Wait. No, no, no. Let me, let me say this. Here, this is a direct material counter to what you just said. You just said a meaning is released, right? When I say uh, intention what if none for of us meaning. spoke English? What is the meaning of this movie if none of the three of us who watched it spoke English? What is, going on? <laughs> what is happening? Thank you, Jeff. Do you understand not, what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yes, but there is there's still meaning. intention and meaning in the visual alone. But, but that meaning isn't received, so who cares? Like it is what received, it was, but it's it interpreted was, from there. A blind viewer, viewers, a, a blind audience who could only hear it. Like there are so many different ways to perceive something that that is where the meaning is created. Have you never watched a movie twice sitting in different seats in the theater and had a different experience? If a meaning was intended and delivered, that wouldn't matter. But how we watch movies, the quality of the way we watch movies, the spacing in which we watch movies, these are all things that we assess. And we say something like, oh, this movie is all overlit, right? Like yes, that, That's the yes. thing you said at the very beginning of this. We think this movie is overlit because we have an understanding of the concept of being overlit, and therefore we are seeing it and deriving meaning. But that meaning is not inherent to the image. That meaning is inherent to the context of how the image is received. And thus, to say that there's some like inherent intentionality to any of this is pointless because it's it's a drop in the bucket of perception. I think with all of this that we're saying, though, if there's Christian no... Christian Metz can eat a fat dick, by the way. <laughs> Who? If there is no onset theme that a director chooses from when creating a story, then there is no story to be told. It's just there things happening. There is no single onset theme. There, but... No, I'm saying there is one in the making of, but when it comes to interpretation, that's when you can get a lot of different themes. But if you don't start from the onset with the theme, then there's no direction at all with the piece. I think. And then I you, think what we're I think what we're all getting so caught. Things. I think we're so getting both getting caught up on. Stuart, Cole, yeah. When a movie is finished, that is its final statement. The only but statement that matters is, is the true? movie. <laughs> The only statement yeah, that, that that's kind of a meaningless thing. Like the text yeah. is not inherent. Like, what did Wong Kar Wai say? No man has ever stepped in a river twice for he to step the yeah. same river, and he is not the same man. Yes. Yeah. But like, I'm essentially just saying, when a movie is done and a director releases it, that is their final intention of that movie. Is the thing uh, that you watch? I would hope. Stewart, I just want to say, uh, the score is now four one <laughs> because. I think we both get a point for that. We just did the impossible. We got Jeff annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> it is two forty. We need to wrap it up. <laughs> I do need. I do. Have, so I have much more to say. I have shit to do today. <laughs> you both won a point for that. Okay, cool. that was a good discussion. I would just like to say that in my notes, I wrote down the name of anthropologist David Graeber, and I don't remember why. <laughs> It's being uh, something to do with the cave. If you remember, if you can figure out why I thought about David Graeber watching this movie, uh, please let me know. I will definitely let you know. All right. So, can we just get? To I the have like one, two things I have like planned to say left about this. If you want to speed run through the rest of it, let let's speed run through the plot. Yeah. Uh, Go. He he goes into the cave. Uh, Roxy is dead. He loses his mind. He takes a can of paint. He paints himself red like the devil. Yes. And then he, with barbed wire still wrapped around him, he takes, he steals like the wood carving sword from the barn. And then he goes to the house and with the intention to kill Callie. Yes. Specifically Callie. He's well, not we, interested we didn't in to punish mention, her for being like a sexual creature. We did not yeah. mention he gets visited twice by his ghost parents. We touched on we it. Touched on we it. touched on it, but yeah. he does get visited twice by his perceptions of his ghost parents. I, I yeah. like that they have like kind of inexplicable wounds. They have bullet yeah. holes because he says he but, saw but them get shot. But they both appear to have been shot like cleanly through their cheeks. Yes. Yeah. Which is which is kind of like it's a mystery how they died. Right. Yeah. Like that 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 the, the, the bullet holes on both of them match, 
but also don't make logical sense in and of themselves. Yeah. Well, they, a lot of them have bullet holes straight through their head, like it was execution. So they they have they have a bullet hole straight through their forehead, and then and one lot- straight through their cheeks. Yeah. Which implies that they got they got shot by different in angles. an orderly fashion, but from two different directions. Yeah. Right. With that's what doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, and Fraser. So I would like to. I yeah. would like to say before he attacks Callie. Yeah. We do see Callie and Clay having sex. Yes. Yes. And I, I feel like you know, the sort of sexual and narrative and also spatial relations between characters on screen are ultimately a creation of editing. I don't think that's a radical thing to say. No. No. Not at all. And we we talked a lot about this, and obviously this is like the crux of gaze theory. But we talked earlier about like, oh, how this, you know, angelic relationship between uh, Callie and Darkly earlier is set up vis-a-vis these shot reverse shots and how identification works in these shot reverse shots. I think it's very interesting that we we we're, we're cutting back and forth between him preparing himself to be like this satanic, you know. Or almost like Angel of Death, right? Like you were saying, Stuart. Right. And the two of them having sex. And I think especially in the aftermath of this bit with Roxy's dead body that is kind of calling attention to this notion of darkly maybe seeing things that he's not present for. Um, it very much does feel like he's watching them have sex because of, of that cross cutting, right. or even that he's more imagining them having sex. Right. I yeah. think yeah. in the moment, except then when he does get there, it is a real thing that's happened. That this sense of like physical barriers pre- that exist to prevent look, which like if you look at his like gazes over them, you start with him explicitly staring at Callie when she's looking at him across the dinner table. Then he's looking at her while she's facing away from him and she's fixing the roof. And then he's looking at her through like a crack in the wood and masturbating. And now he doesn't even need to be physically there to see what it is. That is how entrenched in his perception his gaze the like literal reality spatial reality of this movie is i would also like to point out that during that sex scene it has very once again what we said was normal lighting and then the second he bursts in the reds just get blown through the roof yeah and it's not like the filter stuff that we had seen with roxy's cabin either it's very clearly like color timing yeah not done on set you know, just which is just just to have a different effect of how the colors, the like distorted inhuman strange colors in this space work. Well, and and when uh, Darkly gets there, his first swing misses and hits an electrical circuit, and a fire yes. starts right away. Yes, and there's there's a very interesting parallel we're gonna get to at the end because when, but I'm gonna call attention to the first bit when they set fire to the shoe. And burn the dog. It's very, very intentional that it se- looks like the flames are right in front of Darkly's face, even yes. though it, it's yes. far away on the lake. Yeah. And we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to that later. I'm gonna put a pin in that, but I'm gonna come back to that later. <laughs> How many pins? <laughs> <laughs> How many pins do we How have? How many pins do we have? Too many. Um, and so. Uh, I'm going to just describe this scene as like a rampage scene. Yeah. Darkly comes through and just starts wrecking havoc and tries to murder Callie. Specifically Callie. Yes. Because and Clay she says, is For just the an love op- of God. And he says, precisely. Precisely. Yeah. Jeff, but, do you want to tell your Becca story? Oh, yeah. So I watched this movie with Becca, a uh, guest, previous guest of the show and my fiance, who um, started watching the movie and fell asleep about 10 minutes in. And then she woke Rude. up during this scene. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's just wrecking shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the fire is... Uh, it's just a tremendous reaction. The house is set ablaze. Um, hell like, hell has come to heaven, in a way. Yes. I mean, he's literally the devil. He's painted yeah. himself red. And it, as this is happening, Jude yeah. comes back. And Jude sees Clay, like, knocked down on the ground... Uh, at this point, uh, Darkly has chased Callie up the stairs, and he's getting ready to swing his sword at her. And that's when she says, I love you. 
and he stops mm -hmm. and hesitates for a moment, doesn't say anything, but that's when Jude then comes up the stairs and shoots Darkly in the back that pierces right through his heart. Yeah. And he... Uh, Darkly being killed by a man named Jude, who he thought was his friend, uh, is like Clay being a carpenter. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things that, like, yes. feels like the movie is dangling a low-hanging fruit religious analogy in your face. Yes. Just so you can, like, realize kind of how cheap of of an interpretation that would be. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the sort of thing Darkly would latch on to. Right. And so Darkly is on the ground, Callie immediately distraught, and he says, who will love me now? And dies. And Cal It's a well, actually, really actually, sad movie. He doesn't die, really, because he's, like, dying. But that's when Jude gets Callie out of the house, and then Callie turns around and looks at the house, and this is the pin that I put in. I'm pulling in one pin of our five pins out. It's the same effect. It's almost the same shot verbatim when Darkly was looking at the fire barge of the shoe and the, how the fire looks like it's right in front of his mm. face. It's almost the exact same match shot, shot yeah. where the fire looks like it's right in front of her face, yeah. but she's looking at the house from a distance. Um, Darkly dies in the fire. And Darkly pr presumably Darkly dies, and dies in the fire. A circus family shows up yeah and the next morning everything's in flame the barn even burnt down too yeah which presumably could have been untouched but i think it, i don't know for the thematics the whole thing is yeah good. the whole thing is burned to the ground paradise i do lost. think one last thing because we already do we have anything left we really need to say about the circus well it's just they show up they an say an elephant's there an elephant's there yes and, and we they're like, the elephant. we're like, we were a traveling circus on a barge, a storm blew through and we lost our big giant shoe. And now we've been wandering through the forest. Would you like to come with us? Yeah. Which is interesting that they seem to be like lost in the forest. Yes. Like I said, that there's this sense that there, there is a rea there is a civilization, civilization in huge air quotes, by the way, that exists outside of this space that the characters are in, but it seems infinitely there it seems like you have to want to go there and if you don't want to go there the forest is a space where you can just be yeah. and there's this bit early on then but, th but this is then like the nice little twist of the knife on that very idea is just a bit early on where darkly says this like half joke half parable where he says i was always told you can only walk halfway into a forest because after that you're walking out of a forest and when he says that, Callie kind of is like, you don't understand forests. Yeah. Like, she's like, you you philosophically do not understand, like, the potency of being out here in the middle. But the circus performers who have been wandering in this forest for at least a week. At least, yeah. They say the same thing to her. And she, like, she doesn't, I don't think she says anything, but, like, Judd feels like she concedes the point to them in that moment. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Like she she doesn't respond the same way. She's a lot more accepting of this idea that like it's there is always a destination. There is an outside. Yeah. Which is such a weird way to end the movie because that's the last beat of the movie. And it ends and the movie's yeah. over. Very I don't know terrible. what it means because I don't know. are we done hard, talking about the movie? It's hard to find meaning in life. Well, yeah. is there any post text, Jeff? Oh, um. <laughs> he pulls out his phone, starts thrifting through box office. I have, mojo. I have a major bit of post text that Hit we me. not about this movie though. Hit um, me. I, I will bring it up when we are done talking about this movie. Nope, all on mic. I want to well, hit three hours. Uh, no, it'll happen. I can do it on mic. Well, I have the thing I want to close the episode out with. Well, I just want to know post text. How much money did it make? What did it do in the box office? Um, I cannot. Is there <laughs> box office info for this movie? There isn't. <laughs> there is no box office numbers on IMDb. The numbers. I'm gonna check the numbers. I'll text box office mojo. It does not Fuck seem box to... office mojo. Jeff literally just said that not too long ago. Jeff, did you see what they did to IMDb? It's it's disastrous. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life, ever. What they do to IMDb? <sighs> they. <sighs> 
I can't even describe it. It's so awful. Uh, if you search up the Passion of Darkly Noon on Box Office Mojo, it does not come up. It just shows up the Passion of the Christ, Passion of Joan of Arc. Well, this mo- this movie comes out. Um, Entertainment it Weekly made. doesn't like it. Fangoria does like it. Um, Mark Kermode's a big fan. Who wrote the Fango review? Oh, God. Jason Tannis. That might be a retrospective. Fango flashback. The passion. Yeah, I think that might be a retrospective. Forty-four percent in Rotten Tomatoes, even though this is before the Rotten Tomatoes era. Um, but you know what I say? I don't have much post text for this movie. I'm sorry, but I say good movie. There's. I mean, as far as I know, it kind of like flopped, and is mostly known as this like oddity, weird anomaly in all these people's careers. And I will say, like. When when I I said told Jeff I wanted to do this, I fully thought this was like one of Brendan Fraser's first movies. No, there like was... I thought this occupied the same space in his career as Encino Man. No, as it does for Vigo and for Ashley. Mm. You know, but no, Fraser like, has multiple. Uh... But he's made a fucking Encino Man already. Oh, he's made Encino Man. He's made Airheads. Yeah, Airheads. Oh, that should be a good movie. I think we should. I I know we we're we're coming up on almost yeah two and a half hours here but uh we should talk about the hair well i was going to talk about the hair well let's get knock the hair raking out but i do want to let's talk about the hair we all agree that airheads is like not a very good movie that really should like yeah it should be a lot better yeah Yeah, okay thank you uh jeff it's uh, no glory days uh i'm looking up uh the hair ranking i got it right here okay you got it why are we still doing the hair justice it's played out man it's played out uh, we couldn't think of anything better. Yeah, you gotta it, have it, a new bit. If you can give us a new bit, Cole, we will gladly transition. Uh, You're 13 episodes in. Put it, <laughs> put it above. Put it's it, now just like a begrudging thing we do. It's put it above younger hair. and younger, below glory days. Above younger and younger, below glory days. Okay. Yeah. What's the uh, what's the what's the top of the hair ranking right now? Right now, it's the Scout School Ties Guilty Until Proven Innocent. Twenty bucks now and then. If you heard I mean, of the any of those movies. is definitely going to be number one, right? Absolutely. It's, it's got to. It's got to. Yeah, that's a really well, good George thing. the Jungle might be. But I don't know. <sighs> that movie's bad. Here's the thing. Is so, that that movie is bad. So? What's that got to do with the, the hair? People need to grow up and stop liking movies. <laughs> obsessing over movies for their childhood. I got a hot mummy take, but I don't know if I should share it. Not yet. Maybe I should call. I, I don't think I've episode. ever revealed the hot take that might end Stuart and I's friendship. Does it, is it about the mummy? No, but I call. I know you would agree with me, so I'm not going to say it. Can we say it off mic? That's two things you got to tell me off mic. Well, no, that, well, no, because I'm I'm still still going to end our friendship if I say it. I can't. Um, say it. Do we have anything else to say, or can I hit well, pull I, the pin okay. out of the hot take? One pull, of the pull the pin out of the hot. Pull take. the pin out of the hot take. I do have one more talking point that yeah. I just wanted to go through, but go ahead. Oh, go through your talking point then. Well, it's just like the you know what does this movie tell us about Brendan Fraser's career? Oh, about because it may not have done much uh, for him, but I feel it tells like, us he's a good actor. But it, but I feel like him taking this role and taking this movie with this director. It was shot in Germany, and like whether that speaks to anything well it's like at this point he's trying to he's he really wants to be a serious actor and we've talked about this like he keeps getting these comedy roles but he's really trying to be a serious actor at this point it's a very like selfless and brave performance yes yes I because agree. he has to be so grotesque and we've talked a lot about the selflessness of brendan fraser on the yes. show which is like, like an opposite of John Travolta. Yeah, like so many, like Fraser is willing to give himself over to the performance and play the idiot, play the grotesque monster. He doesn't have a need to always look good on screen and like be the hero. Yeah. Like even in Glory Days, a movie we're covering next week, he's basically just playing like a beta. Yeah. Good movie. <laughs> All right, Cole, pull the pin. Uh, you have nothing else you want to say? I am. I think I've said my piece on the past. I've said my piece. Good movie. I liked it. Good movie. Uh, the 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 character played by Boris Karloff, Frankenstein in the movie Frankenstein. Yes, Frankenstein's his name is Frankenstein too. And people need to stop being like, "I'm actually he's a monster." No, his name is also Frankenstein. Yeah, because he would have the same last name. Exactly. Thank you. And who's getting married to Elsa Lanchester in the Bride of Frankenstein? It's not Colin Clive. It's Boris Karloff. 
Frankenstein. Thank you and good night. <laughs> All right, so we're discussing Frankenstein. I'm yeah. glad you've been holding on to that. Yeah, right. just, just people just shut up about it. Okay. I'll, I'll call in. I'll call in and give you my mummy hot take when you do the mummy episode. Yes, please do. All right. Okay. Uh, can I reveal the thing I've been holding on to for a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um. So Cole, you yeah. might be back on the show sooner than you expect. Did, um, did Paradise, Paradise City, City a has date? a release date, folks? <gasps> no. <laughs> Uh, John Travolta and Bruce Willis in Paradise City. The trailer dropped apparently one week ago. Oh my god! It's released. It comes out November 11th. <gasps> oh shit! When? Okay, let's talk off mic. Off mic, we'll discuss. I just want to let the audience because Cole, you did you put a pin in Paradise City? I claimed Paradise City at about a year uh, and a half again, ago. Once again, like every episode I've been on on this show, for a tourist reasons. Chuck Russell. Chuck Russell. Good director. Stuart, I'm going to show you this picture. <laughs> oh my god! I think I think I said this on the Valley of Violence episode or the Gotti episode, but I'm going to say it again. I do not know if any director in history has a better first two movies than Chuck Russell. Cool. I just sent you a picture. Um, enjoy. Um. Anyway, uh, so thank you, folks, for listening. <laughs> Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you are listening on. Thanks so much, Cole, for joining us this week. Um, next week, we'll be covering Glory Days. Good movie. <laughs> Glory Days, a Ben Affleck vehicle. Um, in the meantime, please rate, review, subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. As a reminder, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. You uh, pop into our Reddit, r slash Travolting. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at TravoltingPod. You can find me on Twitter at Jeff W. Sweeney. You can find me on Instagram with all my good movie takes at Stuart Elmer 95. Cole, anything you want to plug? Uh, I just want to say that you know Glory Days is a good movie because Ben Affleck is in it. Um, <laughs> as always, special thanks to Rebecca Johnson for our graphic design and Michael Van Bodegum Smith for the theme music that's now taking you out. Have a happy Halloween, folks, and talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.